start that. There we go. Okay, great. So um, it looks like we have all members of the task force present. Does look that way. Great. Okay, thank you. And uh, we'll start this evening with public open time. So members of the public that have joined, if there is something you would like to comment on that's not currently on the agenda for this evening, um, this would be an opportunity to do that. And we will provide you with a few minutes to do that if you want to raise your hand. Um, if you can see that, I don't see the attendees list. There are actually so no. currently there are no members of the public. So okay, so we have six registered, but no members currently in the room. Okay, got it. I will resend um, links to them just so they have it. Okay, that makes public open time pretty easy. Okay, great. So we will keep moving along because I know we have a lot on the agenda tonight. And if we're lucky, we will get to the waste and water if we have time. Okay, so first item on the agenda is to approve the action minutes. If someone would like to make a motion make to a motion. approve. Yeah, I'll make a motion and to approve the minutes. I'll second. Urban. Great, thank you. So those are approved. And uh, committee and staff announcements are next. So if anyone has something to add that's above and beyond agenda items, that's not for discussion, but can make an announcement at this point, Urban? Yeah, I've got, uh, I've got two different things. So first of all, um, two of our members here on the cap have been appointed uh, or reappointed to city commissions. So first of all, Greg Hildebrand was reappointed to the planning commission last week, so which is great news. He will be responsible for implementing all of the very uh, stringent requirements we've got now for building and planning in Mill Valley. Um, and I'll say that uh, the uh, I asked several former chairs of the Planning Commission to give feedback on the candidates that we had interviewing for an open seat, aside from Greg's seat, and unsolicited, wasn't asking opinion about Greg, but unsolicited. They all wrote back and said, and by the way, Greg is fantastic. We definitely need to reappoint him. So um, oh, that's good. Yeah. So you've got the support of, uh, of your colleagues. Um, oh, and thank secondly, you. Yeah. So congratulations, Greg. Um, and then secondly, Karen Jaber was appointed to BPAC. Um, we had two openings and uh, Karen is filling essentially Paul Moe's position uh, when Paul cycles off, uh, which is sad. <laughs> and, um, cycles off. and we also appointed a phenomenal <laughs> woman who's actually a city planner and has actually literally written a book about how to make cities um, more bike friendly and pedestrian friendly. And I am not kidding. Someone literally <laughs> has written a book about this topic. So it was an incredible find that she moved to Mill Valley and learned about BPAC and then applied and both knocked our socks off. Karen did an unbelievable presentation, but two of the council people next mm -hmm. to me said that woman needs to run for city council. And I'm not kidding. So uh, <laughs> really very, very impressive. So anyway, I wanted to make that announcement. Secondly, I was in a meeting this afternoon about legislative uh, agenda, and this may not be news to, uh, will not be news to Danielle and Christine and maybe some of you others, but um, apparently on the legislative uh, agenda, sorry, on the ballot initiative agenda for this year um, is a uh, statewide um, ban on, um, single-use plastic for the state of California. Um, so single-use plastic ban in containers and a tax on single-use plastic funds for recycling and environmental programs. So I wasn't aware of that, Christine and Danielle, I'm sure you were aware of that. Um, so that's on the November 22 um, ballot um, or election ballot. And um, that's interesting, right? Because something obviously that we're trying to implement already in Mill Valley and several other cities in, in Marin are also trying to do that. And uh, that's something that we might just get help from the state uh, to help uh, get done. So uh, that's good news, I think. That was it. Thanks, Urban. Any other announcements from staff or task force members? 
Okay, great. We will move into old business first and then new business and the old business item. So this is actually going back to the discussion we had um, in our last meeting around um, building an energy related programs. And so we had a quite a hearty discussion around that. Um, the intention was not to bring back the entire document to the subcommittee and to the task force and kind of have a, a rehash of everything, but to, um, you know, Christine and Danielle were able to take all of that discussion, bring that back to the document, make some modifications based on discussion and agreements. Um, I also did a review of that and um, Al and I had some discussion as well offline around it. So we are bringing back that revised version, which hopefully everyone had a chance to take a look at prior to the meeting. And we are opening up to um, any additional task force questions um, before we open it up for any further public comment. Danielle, do you or Christine want to share that section? Yeah, I can share it. Um, and it looks like we have one member of the public. And as a reminder, I sent um, a memo, a cover memo that helped hopefully explain um, the areas that are new and different from the Larkspur cap in which we talked about as part of the matrix beforehand uh, be at the last meeting. So with that, let me pull up. Okay. Is this big enough that everyone can see it? Pretty big. Okay. So I guess maybe starting just with questions. If anyone has any questions. I have a question. Um, so I sent, uh, Danielle, I sent you and Debbie some comments on this. Did you receive those or not? Yes. Okay, good. So I felt like we had gone through a lot of this last time and um, I just wanted to make sure that the things that we talked about, at least from my perspective, were gonna be captured. So I wrote on the document as well as a cover page with those. I don't need to go over them here in this meeting, but if either of you wanna review that um, offline, we can do that. Well, I just think things that are important to capture here that we discussed last time so that we're, um, we're all on the same page. Well, Urban, I think this would be the time to do it because I think what we're going to ask is for the task force to approve the document. So if there's changes that you'd like to see made, I think we should talk about them tonight. Um, I think that might be appropriate. Okay, um, sure. Um, I'm gonna have comments on many of these in that case, but yeah. they're literally the exact same comments that I made. Um, whatever, a month ago when we went through this. Right. Um, I guess, yes, we just have to get, uh, you know, look, trying to build consensus on the document is what, what we're trying to do, I guess. So, um, yeah, and I was going to just add that um, I read through the comments, Urban, and I, um, after reading through them, I felt like we were at a point where we are fine tuning. So I felt pretty good about that. But to Danielle's point, if we need to make that a more public discussion, we should probably touch on those points. And then Danielle, would we be able to say have we have the public discussion if there's any changes, but we won't necessarily bring the document back? Like it'll be approved based on those changes? Yeah. Or and updates? We don't, okay. we don't necessarily need to wordsmith, but um, you know, if there's concerns about certain words or the approach, um, I think we need to have that discussion tonight. Um, and then the task force will have the opportunity after public comment to modify as well as approve or recommend that these actions be incorporated into the climate action plan. And as a reminder, and maybe Christine can spend a moment, um, we don't need to get, I don't think necessarily, um, 
the wording is not as important as the actual program, because what Christine does, whether it says develop recommendations for city council consideration or develop an ordinance, the intent is still to have regulations. And it's those res regulations that Christine is considering and projecting out what the emission reductions are. So I don't think we need to get as caught up into that language. Some of the language is important because it does indicate intent and we need to be careful about that intent. But just so you know, if a program is in the document related to looking at regulations, Christine uses that language to project out the emissions reductions related to that overall intent of those programs. And Christine, if you wanna spend a minute yeah, um, you're correct. So if it says adopt a, an ordinance, I'm going to assume that that ordinance is adopted and 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 calculate do the calculations from there. So the idea here is that you know you'll see the quantitative uh, impact, and it will say clearly in the climate action plan that if all of these programs are implemented, then the reduction will be whatever whatever it comes out to be. But even if it said, uh, consider regulations for council consideration, you're still looking at that overall goal of whatever that those regulations are in quantifying the emission reduction. That's right. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So are we gonna do these one at a time? You wanna like call out, you know, RAC one and see what comments we have and then go on to the next one and proceed that way? Yeah, or? I think, yes, I think we should do it that way. And I don't know if we want to take public comment before we move into. And I think uh, Susan might have a question too. Are we taking pub public comment or are you asking me to go ahead? I, I'd make, make, make a recommendation maybe that we go through this, the task force, and then at the end of the electrification part, the, we can take public comment on the whole section. And then similarly for transportation, we can go through it as a team and then take public comment. I, my, I, had, I have two comments. One I'll come to later, but at least to start with. The first thing, when we approve the, the minutes, I believe the minutes referenced um, a work plan and what I it's more of a point of clarification for me I'm not clear when that work plan is envisioned to be at least a first pass in place because a lot of this you know a lot of these things for study and drafting I think will come out of the work plan my my sense is that we would be aiming to have a first pass work plan to accompany the the climate action plan is part of our deliverable since we have all of us here engaged to work on that as well in support of it. I just wanted to clarify that. And if that's the case, can we reference that someplace in the actual plan beyond just the minutes? Um, I think Danielle, yeah. Yeah, I I think um, the work plans that I, that I saw that the, I think it was for the transportation committee was working on, are much more detailed than what we had in mind and the kind of work plans that have been included in the other uh, climate action plans that have been adopted. So when we're talking about work plans, um, essentially each action would be identified in, uh, in a matrix, in an appendix, and it would say, um, you know, who's responsible for implementing that? So what department, which department is a timeline? Um, so kind of helping to at least take a, a first pass at prioritizing. So kind of like short-term, medium-term, long-term. And so that just helps to identify which are the most important and need to be worked on immediately. And um, the GHG reduction, uh, the funding sources potentially, you know, if they need grant funding or if it can be, it would be paid out of, you know, the, the general fund because the, it's something that the staff can take on. And, um, and, you know, sometimes there's other, you know, uh, oh, and then we usually have like a tar what the target is, like, how are we going to measure progress? And 
And sometimes we'll also kind of include like where that information can come from as well. So that's really what we're talking about a work plan. It's a pretty high level work plan. It's not spelling out specifically what actions are gonna be taken. That's something that is done after the climate action plan is adopted. And so then staff would go, typically staff would go to the council, say these are the things that we wanna work on. And then from there develop you know, exactly what's going to be done and how it's going to be um, approached at that time. It really isn't something that we include in the climate action plans. Just to follow on to understand that, th that makes sense. Um, what I heard is that we're gonna have a high level work plan a la the matrix you just outlined with the elements that you said as an appendix to the climate action plan. I guess I'm trying, and then that'll then go into actual sort of work streams post, you know, after. But in terms of developing that that high level work plan, that, as you described, do we envision that as something that is included in appendix on our deliverable date this spring? And if so, I guess I'm advocating that let's do it because we've got all of us here gathered to work on it or help support for, you know, putting that together. What? Sure. I mean, it's something that I, I would typically do with staff and then we'll bring it forward to you in the draft plan okay. at the at the end of the process. I think, you know, this is taking a little bit more time than what we had originally envisioned. So I think we're looking at an extra meeting, but we'll yeah. we'll have to, you know, kind of map it out how we're going, what we're going to do it, and during the remaining meetings and when we'll when we'll do it. But yes, mm -hmm. the intent was that at least in the final draft that we bring forward that you'll see the work plan then and can comment on it and, and make revisions at that time. Okay, because it looked like we had a, a meeting, seven was our last, but then I saw on the agenda that there's like an unnumbered meeting, which I guess would be number eight, where potentially this could come forward. I guess from a individual section, I, I hmm. on behalf of the subcommittee, I would want us to be able to review that work plan in advance of that meeting, if that is indeed the meeting where the task, where it's brought to the task force. Is that something you think would be feasible to do? I think what's happening is we're getting into the details about things and some people are ready to do that, but I think we really have to get to the program and every all the task force agree on the programs. Yeah. Depending how that goes, I might actually take the whole climate action plan to the city council to make sure they're comfortable with the programs before mm -hmm. getting into this idea of a work plan and implementation, because I don't want to spend time working on something yeah. that is basically the programs aren't going to be supported. Mm -hmm. So th those are the things that are playing in my head. So right now yeah. I'm just trying to package the programs, get it into a place and then and then strategize on how we go about doing that. But um, yes, implementation is part of that and implementation plan is part of that. But I think it's a bit higher level than what the subcommittees have been trying to, to go for, mm -hmm. which I appreciate because you're trying to get to implementation, but mm -hmm. this again is a policy document that will then lead to implementation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, great. Um, so obviously more to come on that particular item. So thanks for asking about that, Susan. Um, so we're going to go through REC one first. Um, Urban, do you want to comment? And if anyone else on the task force has questions or comments, they can add on top of that. So can I just ask um, anywhere that we deviate from the county or Larkspur, which was our starting point, could uh, could you just highlight that so we are very mindful of uh, where we're going off and doing something different. That would be really helpful, I think. But my comment on the first one is not very much, except that um, to reiterate, and this is kind of a general comment, which is in our approach on all of this has always been to uh, work together with the county and in fact, pretty much implement what the county is doing. And that has put Mill Valley in sort of like the top one quarter of uh, all the jurisdictions in Marin in terms of implementing a reach code, um, you know, that's, you know, a, a green reach code. And um, I think that should be continued to be our policy going forward. That we continue to work with the, the county and being in, um, in working in lockstep with them 
and uh, maintaining that kind of high level of uh, you know green building code that we've that we've had in Mill Valley. Thanks, Urban. Any other questions or comments from the task force on C1? Christine, I'm hoping you can take the lead on what's different between- Oh, F sure, okay. sure, uh, absolutely. Um, I don't have the county one right in front of me, but I would say that this is um, exactly the same wording or, or very, very similar to the wording that's in the county code, uh, the county cap, as well as the other caps that have been adopted. I think um, the update building codes would, you know, this isn't, I mean, we're really talking about the, the breach code, which is identified later on. Um, sometimes, you know, you just looking through your own um, development code, your own municipal code, you might have standards to for for solar that need to be revised or reviewed. And I haven't looked at them, but um, but that's why it says, you know, as necessary and where appropriate. So just in, in the future, if you if you feel like the, the your municipal code is in any way constraining medium or large scale installations, sometimes there there are there is language along that. So that that would be something that would be specific to Mill Valley. But um, I think what you're talking about doing a reach code, yes, that's, that was definitely as part of a countywide effort, which actually is already started for this next building code. And that is identified later on in um, REC3. So. And is REC2 also the same as what was in the other um, caps? And REC2, that's a little different because um, previously, the MCE, uh, is the resource integration plan, the older one had said that it would be 95, 100% uh, GHG free, or no, I think it was, nine, I think they were targeting 100%, um, but the latest integration resource plan targets 95% greenhouse gas free by 2022 and beyond. So that's the assumption that we're going to make. So it's not quite 100%. Uh, that's for the light green electricity. It is a lower carbon content than what was reported in 2018 and I believe in 2019 as well. So there is still further GHG reductions that will be realized from that, from REC2, C2. Okay. But otherwise it would be basically the same, right? Just otherwise it's the same, yes. I mean, MCE has changed, but the language otherwise is not. The other, exactly, yes. Okay, good. I've got no comment in that case on that. That's fine. Okay. Okay, great. Any other comments there? Can we move to C3? Okay, let's keep moving. Um, for REC3, this is what I, I would just mention that the county has already started with other staff members at through MCEP to look at these um, draft regulations for a reach code. The new building code is the 2022 code and it goes into effect on January 1st, 2023. So we, by the end of this year, there, you know, or actually probably early fall, um, there hopefully will be a model ordinance available for all of the cities and towns to adopt. And it, they're looking at, you know, all electric residential buildings and also some um, and I think some, you know for remodels to perhaps have some kind of standards for replacement of um, or like a kind of a menu of options and and the property owner could play pick something from that to uh, do a, a natural switch out a natural gas appliance with electric or do some other kind of energy efficiency or renewable energy project like add solar. But this is all very preliminary at this point. We just, I think they had their first meeting last last month and they're going to be doing some outreach to the development community as well. So I think we're gonna have some good progress on this and it's definitely a countywide collaboration. Okay, so all of RC3A is a countywide collaboration to basically mm -hmm. move in that direction as it's stated here? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Because it says require all new construction, right? Which is, as you just said, not really what the code is right now, right? It's either you do 
electric or you do a variety of other things, right? To kind of counteract. That's right. That's what it says right now. So we're looking at the next code update. Yep. And, okay. and so the new code, um, the state building code, the, the base code does have a preference for all electric buildings. They didn't go all the way to requiring all electric buildings. That's probably something that they're going to be doing for the 2026 or the 2025 code that's adopted in 2026 uh, or goes into effect in 2026. So, uh, but they have things like if you want to have a natural gas appliance, you also have to have an electric outlet, uh, like a 220 um, outlet for like a stove um, installed at the same time. So that that means that later on, when those if those appliances are swapped out, that it will facilitate that. And then there's other things in there that just kind of gives more preference to all electric, but doesn't do an outright ban on um, on you know just all natural gas appliances and heating systems. I think they really are kind of waiting for the individual cities and towns to take the lead. As as we've heard, we've all I think it was last count I have. 33 cities and towns in, in California have adopted this an all electric building code requirement. And, and so I just think the state is wants to see more of a groundswell of, you know, at, at the local level before they go ahead and, and make it a, a statewide requirement. There may also be some other issues with just like the for the towns and cities that are in colder climates and heat pump technology may not be as um, cost effective for those areas as well right now. And that could be a reason why the, the state didn't um, adopt it a statewide regulation. Or so, you think it'll, so you think it will continue to be preference for electric um, in the, the updated code that's coming up? Yeah, there apparent, apparently there is a preference for electric. Yeah, um, so but it's, yeah, so I guess but that would be my comment here on RC3A would be that it should not be banned. It should be um, a preference for electric. Yeah, so, so, so I was talking about the state code has a preference for electric. I, I'm pretty sure because all of the other cities and towns, all of the other climate action plans at this point um, have this program in them. And so I think that the that the model code, code, reach code that comes out of this process will be an all electric residential building requirement. It will, it will be. So county will yeah, be. Yeah, I was all, talking. All well, and well, urban, um, what urban, what, what I'm finding in, in the last couple of planning commission meetings is that, you know, it's not a code requirement, um, but, but the community and the architects are stepping up and they know that they want, they want their project um, approved. And last night, um, they, they offered up um, HVAC heat pump and and uh, HVAC hot water when it wasn't required um, and PV for the roof, um, uh, you know, with the um, hope of encouraging the design review approval um, when they didn't do a study session. So I I think people are ready. I I think if we don't if we don't put it out there now, um, you know, and and kind of help lead the process with the other communities. Then, then we're going to struggle in the planning commission and and those review process to um, to get people to just have the incentive to to do the right thing and understand how much more efficient they are because they they just perform so much better. And if you're if you're putting in something new, um, it doesn't make any sense to put in in some old gas technology that is going to sit there and burn gas for the next thirty years. Yeah, no, that's, that was my experience as well. And I've said that in prior meetings, I'm just making sure that our language here is consistent with whatever the county is doing. So there's a county saying that they're now gonna go and require all electric in the, the new code. Yeah, that's the intention is to put forward a, yeah. a model ordinance that is all electric Perfect. for Great. residential Hold, Good. Let's hold do on, that. I, I, believe, I believe there's, and Christine, I could be wrong, but I believe there is a memo out from the county that they're not going to go all electric for this code cycle, but they are looking at it for the, the try and, and that's why you'll see the language the way it is. It doesn't have a year, but it provides us, right now the county, like Christine has said, is working on this and the county's working on this. There's a lot that goes into it, including cost effectiveness that has to be done. And that is for a, a reach code as well. So these things are happening right now. It says in conjunction with a, a, the triannual update. So it could be that this is in place for 2026. We'll know more in the coming weeks 
as the county works on this, but that's why it doesn't give a good, given year right now. Christine will be setting a target year and she'll have to do that. But, you know, um, again, the point taken, we're trying to collaborate with the county and all the jurisdictions. We're working towards that goal, but we're also trying to be realistic cost-wise um, as well as implementation-wise. So those are the things that are going on. Good. So as long as we're um, we're phrasing this thing in the right way so that it's not triggering anybody um, about a ban, um, because that can be an unnecessary distraction. Um, and we're working together with our partners in the rest of the county because these things need to be rolled out um, at the county level, um, just to, on a practical, um, practical level. So it sounds like we are, which is great. All right, on to the next one. Okay. Yeah, let's keep moving to B and C, Christine. Sorry, I was waiting to be recognized. I, I presume- Oh, I'm sorry. Using that process. Um, Hi, Susan. Thank you. Just a quick question, I guess, for Christine. Is yeah. there any thought, or Danielle, could it make, do you, is there a possibility that, we, that the county might separate new and remodel? Seeing that, seeing it's going remodel, to be the remodel can be more difficult in terms of the switch, but new, you're starting from scratch, you can go electric, per Greg's comment. I'm just curious. Right. My understanding is that they are looking at both. Um, remodels, of course. Um, Reading them differently is what I'm saying. They're looking well, at they're not They're not different if they're major remodels and they're tearing out all their HVAC and replacing okay. all the appliances. Okay. That's where, we're, that's where we're talking. That's why we see them together as new construction and major Fair remodels, enough. because major remodels is mostly what we get around here. Okay. Thank you. Right. And, and I do believe my understanding is that they are also going to be looking at smaller remodeling projects and maybe having some requirements um, for those. And that would probably be like a menu of choices of upgrades that could be that could be done. But again, this is very preliminary. They've just started this. Um, this and that could help order. with. Uh, yes. When we get to the other section of C3B. Um, and C3C, the menu of choices for those smaller remodels or um, switch outs might be helpful for the conversation of those next two items. But I think we also have Paul that has a question. Okay, um, well, I I'm, I'm, uh, want to talk about REC4 if we're ready for that. I have a couple of things before we get there. Okay. I think we're not done with C3B and C. Yeah, so Christine, can you just make a comment about where, where the county is on B and C? Okay. Um, so the B one is, is included in the county's cap as well as other caps. And um, the, the C, the R3C is not included in those other caps, it, I believe it is concluded in the Fairfax cap, as you probably, as you may recall, the Fairfax cap is shooting for 100% GSC reduction by 2030. So I think that's why they have this um, program in there. And as far as replacement, that is not something that we're currently working on. That is something that was envisioned, at least in the county's cap for, um, for studying and drafting a, an ordinance and, and consideration and adoption in 2024. Yeah, and this, and this talks about study alternatives and, and draft regulations. So it's, it's just getting it on the, on the list where, where it doesn't end up not being something on a future work plan. So it's, it seems as though there's no risk to keeping it here. So what's the difference between, sorry, B and C? I mean, it's a, I see the date. What else is different about them? Well, one, one is, one if it's something burns out and you have no gas or, I mean, you have no heat or you have no hot water, then what do you do? And the other one is your equipment may still be working, um, but maybe it's getting to its end of life um, and right. you don't really have to, it's not burned out yet, but um, you might want to plan for replacement and so this is to encourage people and there's tons of incentives out there, which I've been learning about um, and I, we can share at another time, but, but the state just kicked in with a new program called tech and they're, 
they're I mean they're putting in like six grand or something like that for for some some of these things um, for major systems and and so it's different than the Electrify Marin, which might be a thousand, and Bayren might be a thousand. But the new PEC tech program from the state is is adding on top of that, so you can actually potentially get three different incentives from three different organizations. And so the the you know the um, it's it's like the momentum is going that way. It would just be awesome if we could kind of be a community that's helping to lead that without having a you know it's it, it's putting it in our our climate action plan so we can start having this um, discussion and and move in that direction. I, I think there's no harm in keeping it in there. Okay. Yeah, it sounds fine. I mean, we're going to study this thing, right? And we're going to try to get this thing implemented starting in 2030. So is that basically the way we look at this? Mm, no, I think it's not, it, it, it's not starting to implement in 2030. It's concluding, like get, getting well down the road before 2030 the intention so i don't think anyone's going to want to rip out um if they just bought a gas stove last year i don't think they're going to want to rip out a gas stove you know before that thing is ready you know at end of life right or getting close to end of life so yeah um you know seven you know eight years from now sure they might be in that position right but um you know if we're talking about implementing before then then i think it's going to be a different matter so it reads, reads to me like by 2030 right so they've got another eight years of life on their equipment yeah Right. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. But I think the, the nuance that has kind of come to light amongst the subcommittee since last we met last month is this notion of electric ready as, as something we can use. And this might be more again on implementation or target side. But if we can if we can get a fair chunk of our building stock in an electric ready position, like Greg was saying, have that outlet, have the circuit, have the panel, all the stuff ready so that when the day comes that the thing fails or somebody chooses to go sooner because the incentives are too good to pass up or it's getting close enough to end of life that they don't want to wait for a disaster that they can just do it so so that's that's a that's something that we could consider working into this language or it can go into the work plan but that we target that a, a majority of our building stock is electric ready which is relatively minor upgrades but just make sure you can actually do it when the time comes and, and we are talking about feasibility. Um, we're talking about, you know, um, whether it's equitable and all that's in here. And like I said, the, the state, this, this program that I discovered through Bayran, um, one of them just came out December 7th. And then the, um, the other one for the H, and that was for the, um, the heat pump water heaters. And the, there's a new one that's coming out um, here in the, in the spring um, for, HVAC system. So it's the state is moving to help support this. So I think having something in here and it's, and it, it's a, it's a phase in, and it's a process. So yep. um, I think it's, it's, I got, no, I got no other comment on that. So I'm ready to move on. Anybody, everybody else's. I guess, I think so. I, I'm hesitating just because of the, the target. And I, I know, I don't want to belabor that. I was, I was, Pleased to hear that the work plan will include targets, because there's you know there's a little bit of target in here, all, as it is. Does I guess I'm just asking your advice, uh, Danielle and Christine. Does it make sense to include a, a target around elect, electric readiness in support of these goals in the climate action plan, or or should that be going into the work plan? I I think we should take out the by 2030 and put it in the work plan. Oh, but I was not referring to that. I was talking about electric readiness. But, as but as I, I think what's going on is I, I think the, ta the the subcommittee, I think, wants to implement now. All of these are, uh, you're looking at it as implementing now. And I think you really need to look at the language. It's also coordinating. And I think Urban's kind of mentioned that too, is working together. So um, it's, the target will be based on the studies and the work that's done collaboratively. We'll know more as, especially because of the way the cycle is right now, we're lucky. So we'll know more as this green building cycle moves forward. Christine will probably establish target, target dates based on what we see in terms of those reach codes 
and what others are doing to kind of figure out what, you know, what's a likely target versus I believe, the, you know, the, the subcommittee is trying to establish doing the target now. So that, that's what I'm hearing as I'm processing these materials. Um, that I'm so I think our goal, our goal is that our, our climate, our finished climate action plan would be robust enough that, that it would be useful for, um, you know, for um, helping us fight the climate crisis and, and dealing with buildings as they, as people come and propose to build and, and things come up. And so I just, I think, I think for us to haggle about, uh, uh, you know, what those dates are right now, I think I would, I, th I think I agree with with I think what we're saying here is let's put the um, let's put all the keep all these items in here, and then have a follow up for the the target dates with the goal of of having a robust climate action plan that isn't that has some teeth to it. So it'll help me on the planning commission. It'll help a lot of people um, who's who wants to you know do something about this. And and a lot of architects are kind of asking for for help. And and you know what are you guys looking for when they when when we come in here. So I need a good climate action plan to make it happen. Um, if I could just uh, echo what, what Greg's saying, what Susan has, has said, uh, specifically about the targets. Um, I think having targets at a high level gives the city flexibility among the different levers to figure out how it wants to meet those targets. Uh, but if you compare the building electrification sections to the electric vehicle sections, for example, you'll see that the electric vehicle sections have a clear target for the emissions coming from that category. Whereas in the electrification sections for buildings, uh, it, it's more item by item. And so I think one thing that we would like to see given that, that, uh, that we don't wanna get pinned down and too overly prescriptive for our city on what measures to adopt and by when is to adopt a higher level target uh, for you know, when we're gonna be eliminating fossil fuel use from, from buildings, because at the end of the day, we can collaborate all day long. I mean, there's lots of collaboration in the Paris Agreement, but, but ultimately what's mostly happened is kicking the can down the road. So I think if we set some targets and say that by 2025, we wanna make sure that a certain percentage of the building stock in Mill Valley is ready to convert over to electric heat pumps throughout uh, and by 2030, that a, a high a percentage of the building stock is actually zero emissions, that they've made that conversion. Those would be high level targets that create the teeth in the plan that Greg is looking for, that we're all looking for, so that we give the city the flexibility how to meet the target, but we're not, we're not equivocating about the fact that we need targets because this, this is a crisis. This is not just, we're, we're not trying to inconvenience people, but everyone who's polluting with fossil fuels is inconveniencing everyone in the future who's gonna to have to deal with raging fires and, and intense storms and all the like. So for purposes of our discussion and moving on, um, Danielle and Christine, with these two sections, B and C, um, I mean, we want them to be reflective of, of the conversations happening at the state and county level, but we also want there to be a jumping off point for the city of Mill Valley. So that this isn't just, um, you know, something so completely lightweight that it's not anything that makes it to a work plan, but that it has language in here that it allows and opens the door for a more robust work plan with more specificity and target, like what Al was talking about. So um, as far as targets go, so for REC3B, I think I've talked about this before, but maybe not. Um, the way I have done this calculation is to assume that the, um, like for the county, that this ordinance is adopted and it goes into effect in 2024, um, sometime in 2024. So essentially I'm assuming that it's in effect for five years. And then I look at the replacement schedules for all of the different um, equipment, you know, for cooktop, how long does a cooktop normally last? How long? What's the life cycle, lifespan of a, of a, um, you know, a heating system? And then using that data, um, assumes a certain percentage of each different type of appliance would be 
um, replaced each year and then come up with a number. So it's, so it's really grounded more on not, we wanna reduce you know, natural gas consumption by 75% by 2030, but on a kind of a realistic, you know, if we adopt this ordinance, how would it roll out? How, how many appliances can we realistically assume will burn out any, any given year and be replaced? Um, so the REC3C, I think is a really difficult one to quantify because there just really isn't any, um, you know, I think we can have those require, you know, assess the, the, the building stuff, we can look at financing, but it's hard to know how many, um, how many property owners would actually take advantage of that. So that one is a little tricky and to try to figure out how to um, decide, you know, but, but that's what I mean is that it's not just simply setting a target here. I think this is, needs to be kind of grounded in a number of how many buildings do we think can, would take advantage of these. And we do have, like we can look at the Electrify Marin tar, um, rebates that have been available and we have data on how many um, homes have taken advantage of them. It's actually pretty low, but you know, so we, we need to look at some other programs and see. Um, so we, we, we generally, we're looking at track records. We're looking at you know, some kind of vetted methodologies that we can use to, to determine what the calculations and what the reductions are going to be. Is that helpful? Yeah, yeah so, no, I think, I think that is, is helpful. I think one thing from my just current experience, because I've been dealing with Electrify Marin um, and Bay Ren and um, for my own property um, conversion for the, the next phase for me. And what I've discovered in talking to the various um, um, contractors is that they're part of the reason that it's not rolling out because they're not even informing people about it because they, they don't want to deal with it. And I think if, if we have, if we start having some of these, um, if we have some teeth here in our cap, then, then they're going to go, oh, hey, by the way, and they're going to encourage people, they're going to communicate about these, because it's a marketing, a marketing opportunity for them. And it's also an incentive for um, the homeowner. And it's, and it's a matter of communication. And, and some of these subs, they just don't want to deal with like Bayran has a certain amount of bureaucracy you have to go through to be a Bayran contractor. And and I've talked to contractors and they say, you know, we just don't have time. We don't want to do that. But if, if there was a climate action plan that required that they do that, they do it. And then suddenly you'd get the six grand or whatever back. And then people would probably be more interested in, in uh, helping fight climate change. So anyway, that's. No, I understand what challenge. you're saying. And I think, you know, there are some things that the, that the city can do to require replacement. You know, they can, if you, and it's going to be triggered by, a building permit, right? So if you need a building permit to replace an appliance, that's when the town, the city can insist, require that it's an electric one, not a, to replace natural gas. But the city can't require anybody to go and just replace their natural gas heating system with an electric one. They can incentivize it and they can work with the county and they can work, you know, promote all of these other rebates that are available. Um, they can do outreach, but they can't require it. So I think it is something, you know, I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, I could look at like the rate of adoption of solar systems going back from, you know, when they were first adopted and say, okay, well, you know, those were voluntary, it was done voluntarily. There were definitely rebates available that were used at the state level that, you know, to help incentivize people to, to elect to put a solar system on there on their house. So I think that would be a good something that I could use to justify um, or back up the, the, the methodology that's employed in, in developing the calculation. So that's something I'm still thinking about. Yeah. Well, I think from our subcommittee standpoint, the, you know, the calculations for greenhouse gas emissions and, and having a, um, a robust climate action plan that, that puts an item on the on the future work plan um, to, to help the community make the transition are kind of two different things. It's, it's about, you know, how do you get people to, to look at different materials, um, you know, and, and choose something that, like I said, just the over in general, when they're, when they're building a project, instead of um, 
picking out a material that that uh, you know takes a old growth tree, um, you know, there's there's all these options that they have that have nothing to do with greenhouse gas emissions um, directly that are calculate something you can calculate. So I, I think I think we're all kind of saying the same thing is that how can we how can we not take it out just because you can't calculate the um, the emissions on it and and be oh, able yeah. to keep this thing robust enough that yeah, absolutely. And anything that's in the climate action plan is essentially is going to be on a work plan, right? That's why it's in the yeah. climate action plan. The work plan is just kind of prioritizing and and you know identifying funding sources for for all of these actions. But that's why it, that's why they're here to be implemented. If we don't intend to implement them, they shouldn't be in the plan in the first place. So just to to finish off B and C, I heard I heard Urban, you were okay with it as it reads here. I yeah, B is basically the same as what the county is doing. C is a feasibility that we're basically studying, and I think Christine, you know, phrased it correctly, right? Which is that um, we can't compel people to go and, you know, take out perfectly, you know, functioning equipment out of their house and replace it with something different, right? We can certainly provide incentives. We can provide education. We can provide, mm -hmm. you know, green nudges, right? So if they do that, right. yeah, we hope to be able to do that. In a big way. We can't compel people to do this. And right. I think it's the right way to think about it. Oh, okay, so we're leaving the text as is in C, in or, and then we can... yeah. If Danielle and Christine, you think this this works uh, based on your experience, and everybody else is happy, then let's move on to the next one. I think. Okay. Paul, I think you said you had a comment or question about C four. Yeah, I do. I'll start it off. Um, and and we touched on this on the above, but I think this might be the correct area to add in what I'm thinking on line A, and that is um, illustrate the, you know, have a program that actually illustrates the financial incentives of electrification. Because as Greg said and others have said, it's actually in the long run, when you say put on solar panels, uh, you've you've invested you know a, a forty year investment um, possibly on those on those panels, um, but you have a, a curve an electric um, um, curve that's going up at a much higher rate than your uh, initial investment curve. So you've got these diverging curves, and there's the incentive right there. So you know you make the early investment, and you have this annuity that pays off, and all over these different electrification enhancements you can make to your property. It's just, you know, it's going there, it's a win-win. If they put it in, lower carbon footprint, and they reap benefits of the long-term um, uh, lower costs. So I would like to add into say um, line A, at the end of it, just add, um, where it says, uh, you know, the out outreach programs and community partners, um, just continue that sentence and say, by illustrating the financial incentives of electrification, then, then the work plan would give, um, you know, the actual um, examples of that. And then all of a sudden now they get excited and understand the long-term investment in this. So that, that's what I had to add. Okay, thank you, Paul. I think, I think, I think that's overall, that's the right approach, Paul. I mean, if you educate people and you convince them that this is gonna be in their best interest and they will make the right decision, right? So I think that's always gonna be the right approach on all of these matters. Yeah, Paul, I think that's brilliant. I think that's part of the problem. That's probably why I'm doing it at my place because this has been beaten into me for years now through uh, um, through my um, industry and what I'm doing, and and it just seems like if I wait, you know, a number of years and then do it, I'm not getting the benefit out of it like I will. Um, and I've already seen the benefit just from last uh, a year ago changing out my HVAC system um, of how much more efficient it is, and and now the hot water heater is next and. And so anyway, it's, it's, it's kind of exciting, but I know I know I'm a bit of a, maybe a bit of a nerd for it. So maybe it's not um, realistic to think that everyone feels that way, but 
but you, when you really learn more about it, you get kind of excited about doing something about it to help fight the, um, you know, our climate crisis. And, and it's, I don't know, it's kind of what drives me um, for really um, being able to communicate. I think what I'm doing on the planning commission is I'm, I'm educating the community, the architects, um, which I would think should already know some of these things, but don't. And, and the, um, and some of the permit expediters and, and others that are starting to support it. I'm already seeing a lot more support for it from people than I did um, two years ago on the planning commission. Okay, and the interest in moving on, mm -hmm. we have, we're almost at the hour point. Um, so we need to move this along so we can get to transportation. Um, so C4, C5, C6, is anything that's uh, Christine and Danielle that's uh, unique to Mill Valley that's not being discussed in other caps here? I'm just looking at the county's cap right now and the microgrid study i think christine is that something um that might be so the county's cap has a microgrid pilot project because it was a, a drawdown we're in um solution so that was included there i i also need to look at the larkspur cap because it may be in the larkspur cap okay I can pull it too. Um, and then we um, we soften the language for REM1 where feasible um, incorporate into the city facility plan that was based on the conversation last time. Um, understanding that we uh, are working on a facilities plan. Can we move into to the EEC one, if no other comments or questions on the rest there. Um, I just wanted to, um, so I'm looking at the, the Larkspur plan. So the microgrid study one is not in the Larkspur plan. So, and the one that's in the county, again, it's it's there because it it's a, one of the drawdown solutions and they were working on some projects, some specific projects in the town of Fairfax and um, in San Rafael. So there's a potential, you know, I know that they were doing these kind of pilot projects with the hope to kind of roll them out and show um, kind of, you know, so that it would be replicable in other cities. Okay, so you might want to just reflect that in C, uh, C6, that there's a pilot going on in the county that we're going to basically leverage. Okay. Yeah, you know, as opposed to our own study. Yeah. Otherwise, I think we're on to M1. Uh, so M1, M2, M3, um, you know, yeah, I think Danielle just said, right, we're going to basically incorporate a lot of these things into our facilities plans, right? So we've got a facilities plan, facilities need to be updated. <laughs> it's a big investment that we're going to be making, right? So we're obviously going to be looking at opportunities to, you know, green those buildings whenever we can as part of that facilities plan. Correct. Right. Yep. E so that should take care of um, uh, M1, M2, a little bit M3. I think we're probably there already. Energy efficiency programs. Christine, can you, uh, um, I think we want to focus, uh, energy audits is the only one, right? It's different. Uh, energy audits, I believe, is in the county plan. Let me just take a look here. Okay, so the energy efficiency programs, yes. The energy audits is in the county plan. Yeah, cool pavement and roofs are in the in the county plan. The green building reach code, of course. Um, I think the only the new ones that here are the sustainable building materials. So our EEC six, EEC seven are new, and I think the other ones are all. Yeah, those are all in in you know similar to what's in other plans. Which ones are new? 
Sorry? The new ones are EEC7 and EEC6, the sustainable building materials. Those yeah. are the ones I hammer on everybody um, every uh, the second and fourth um, Tuesday of every month. And so why aren't those, um, why aren't six and seven in uh, the county plan or? They just, um, they just weren't, hadn't been brought up. They're not really directly related to greenhouse gas emission reductions. And I think, you know, there are already some requirements in Cal Green, which are referenced here in the, um, in these actions. So I think that this is just the first time that this sort of thing has come up and it, and it is because of, you know, Greg's. Greg's it's work. kind of urban. It's also kind of a reach code ish related item where, you know, if somebody has a choice of decking, are they going to use ePay from the Amazon or are they going to, to get some other alternative that we're always discussing um, in these planning commission meetings when a large amount of resources and materials are going into these new projects. And, and I think I've seen quite a bit of support um, where owners realize that, oh, okay, maybe that's something I can think about, I should think about. And, and the architects are becoming more aware of the alternatives and you know, whether it's the type of siding being used or whether it's you know, um, low, um, low carbon concrete or some of those things. We, I, I just felt like this is important to have it part of our climate action plan, even though it's not about emissions, it's about things that relate to, um, to climate um, action when it comes to, you know, if our forests are going away, then there our carbon sink goes away and, and, and you know, just something to, to, to have in a climate action plan that again would help me in the planning commission when I'm, when I'm trying to um, go through when they, you know, we have these generic comments about sustainability measures, which don't have any teeth to them. And it's really hard for me to say, Okay, what are you doing? And and from last night, the um, the brief that came from the architect, he went through all the design guidelines and everything that he's doing on them, and and there it was silent on sustainability design guideline. There was nothing listed in there, and and so it's it just we need something that we can have in there that helps us with the climate crisis. So that's why well, I've come up with things that in my industry that were that we're starting to specify. And that's kind of becoming the, the more, um, you know, the building is part of building decarbonization, not just electrification, but it's about building decarbonization. And so these are some of the things that, that you know, my colleagues are, uh, and I are working on every day on all our projects. Okay. Any, any flags on this, Danielle or Christine? I mean, it sounds fine to me, right? We're basically encouraging use of green materials. That makes complete sense, right? So any flags from your guys' perspective? No, I, I think they're actually something I'd like to try to include in other climate action plans. Going there forward. you go, Greg. Excellent, Christine. Right there, okay. All right. I think well, this will become not, objective. I, uh, I was gonna mm -hmm. add, um, you know, that these measures, from my understanding, um, would put Mill Valley sort of ahead of other jurisdictions because the mission is to reduce your GSG um, emission targets uh, set by the state. And so what we're doing is, is we're you know going beyond that um, to the extent it affects GHG. It's not clear to me, but um, certainly it has has definitely um, sustainability benefits to it. Um, but uh, yeah, again, I think it does put um, Mill Valley ahead of other jurisdictions, I believe. So. Good. Great. Excellent. Any other comments? Excellent work, team. Danielle, happy? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I'm happy if you guys are Everybody happy. Everybody happy. <laughs> okay, good. Um, all right. So now we're on to M12. Let's see. These are also probably part of the facilities, right? We probably, I think we've already done M1 in Mill Valley, haven't we? We have, a, we have a few more to do. Okay, but that's an ongoing process, just so everybody knows. Yeah. Um, yes, but Al was, um, 
Al, again, it's, you know, making sure these things stay fresh. So Al was great in asking about them. And uh, we've had some turnover at the city. So our new facilities person is now aware of, oh, yeah, we still have a few more. So um, it'll happen at burnout, I think. But thank you, Al. Yeah, and Greg has volunteered to climb poles to actually do the replacements. So <laughs> <laughs> I've got a I've got a hard hat. I'm good. The data that I that I have says that Mill Valley has converted 79% of the streetlights to LED. And that was data I got in May of 2020, um, which came from um, MGSA, which manages those streetlights for all the cities and towns. Great. Okay, good. So M2, that's again, facilities plan, correct? Correct. Do we have M2? Facilities yeah. plan? Yeah. Uh -huh. I'd imagine so. So maybe we should uh, mention that in this. I can do that. I can add it. Okay. And then M3. You said this was in county, Christine, M3? Um, yes, I'm not sure about the 980 schedule. Yeah, it's the 980 schedule is not, but I think that was in, in Larkspur. So it really, I mean, that just depends on whether that works for the city or, or not. We're already doing that. So we'll, you know, we could add more employees, but city hall does that. So that's good. That's fine. Okay. So I think we're done, Great. right? Other than public comment. Yes. <laughs> what are so if no, we've got two members of the public here. Okay. Um, just want to check in with members of the public to see if there are any comments related to the discussion we just had on our, this section of our cap. And as a reminder, yeah, you can raise your hand or press star nine if you're on the phone. Looks like Molly. Hey everyone, I don't have any comment except for to say that this is really exciting that you guys are talking about all these things. And I wish there was a hundred people here. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's it. Great. Thanks, Molly. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Molly. Great. Okay. So we are at 709. Pretty good. Yeah. And um, we are going to move on to um, new business, which is our transportation plan draft and I know everyone received a document for review that was prepared by the subcommittee, um, but Paul and Al and the rest of the subcommittee, um, they're gonna be speaking from a deck, which I will share. We just thought it'd be easier to call out some more specific items because we wanted to highlight, the team wanted to highlight those items that are um, a little different than what maybe uh, you know, presented by a Larkspur and County plan. So a little bit more above and beyond for City of Valley. So I know that I need to be sharing that. So do that. Um, but while I'm getting to that, I will hand it over to Paul and Al to get us, get us started. Okay, uh, Debbie, thank you. Um, our transportation group recognize that we have a local and a global threat to our climate. So we took our commitment very seriously and proactively want to lower the carbon footprint for a healthy and sustainable Mill Valley. Uh, we worked hard to find possible reductions that we could apply to Mill Valley. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Al who will do the major part of our presentation. And then um, Karen and Fiona and myself will be adding as we go. So Al. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, so I'm gonna uh, just give a couple introduction, uh, introductory comments about the process, which was essentially the same as the uh, building decarbonization group uh, took 
to uh, consult other city plans, uh, brainstorm different ideas, and then try to coalesce it all into a, a discussion document. So we can uh, jump ahead to slide uh, five. Um, well, actually on slide, uh, yeah, uh, on just wanted to make one, one note that uh, uh, some of these recommendations will be um, accumulated in a report that's different than a work plan, but, but it more or less summarizes the, the subcommittee's recommendations just so that they're there uh, as, as a resource uh, for both implementation and future discussion. Um, and so we'll, we'll figure out with, with Danielle and Christine the right way to uh, memorialize that, but, but it, it'll just be a short report of the different ideas that were considered so that uh, those can be passed along uh, to those who carry the work forward. Um, so on uh, slide five, you see that, that the transportation section starts with zero emission uh, vehicles. Uh, and the very first item is a, is a target. Um, we learned from Christine that, that the target is actually for uh, passenger vehicle trips that uh, begin and or end in Mill Valley for uh, cars, passenger vehicles that are registered in Marin County. Um, and all of the jurisdictions have targets. Uh, we recommend 45% uh, by 2030 in line with the county. Uh, we think that's reasonable. Mill Valley uh, is, is uh, second only to uh, Tiburon and Belvedere in EV adoption due primarily, we assume, to the wealth of the community. And so uh, being in line with the county seemed like uh, a reasonable place to, uh, to shoot for in terms of uh, EV adoption. And we think that if, uh, if, if, if current trends with technology and infrastructure continue, that, that, uh, that we ought to be able to surpass that target. Um, in addition, uh, there's, there's a plan that's going to be coordinated uh, countywide um, that's actually been written by Christine. Uh, I think we are incorporating that plan into our climate action plan. I think one request that we have is, is we would, uh, before finalizing the cap, would want to review that plan if we're going to adopt it uh, as, as Mill Valley's uh, zero emission vehicle plan. And to the extent that uh, we have additional measures that we want to add to the conversation, we would want a placeholder in the cap to allow us to just supplement that plan. Uh, so we look forward to seeing that plan. Uh, and uh, we, we list out here additional measures that um, that we would want to see included in that plan or, or added as a supplement to that plan. The first one is, is creating financial incentives. When we looked at other caps, most of them focused on parking fees for uh, electric vehicles versus uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. We wanted to broaden this out to give the city uh, and staff flexibility to identify uh, potentially other financial incentives and make sure that those fit our city's uh, budget and other considerations. So we made it a little more general and, and related it to financial incentives. So that is an area where it deviates from, uh, from other jurisdictions. Uh, we also call for expansion of the EV charging networks, uh, especially level two and level three charging with a special focus on schools, multifamily housing, uh, commercial lots and buildings, gas stations, uh, and also the possibility to have charging hubs for use by ride hailing and delivery services and for community use during power outages. And these latter two items uh, would be part of a, a broader countywide effort to coordinate. The charging hubs for ride hailing and delivery services is uh, meant to, to start generating the infrastructure within Marin County uh, for ride hailing and delivery services to, to be comfortable using EVs because they would have a place to uh, fast charge them using level three charging stations. Uh, and for community use, the idea would be uh, uh, jurisdictions throughout Marin have been developing uh, these charging hubs for communities to deal with the, the power outages, but they're mostly focused on charging laptops and iPhones. But as uh, electric vehicle adoption uh, increases throughout the county, um, there's likely to be uh, a need for resilience around charging those vehicles. Uh, and so uh, exploring solar charged battery hubs that where people can charge, that, that's a project that's, that's worthy of greater 
uh, investment and attention. Uh, I don't know if that particular um, idea is mentioned in any caps, uh, but it certainly would be a, a coordinated effort across the county to find the best place for, for those. And to the extent that we wanna create a base of that in Mill Valley, uh, our, our community would certainly have be stakeholders in, in that process. Um, expanding education and outreach efforts, that's throughout all the caps, uh, encourage or require uh, zero uh, emission vehicle use by ride hailing and delivery services. So this is giving them nudges or, or requiring that. This comes from the Larkspur cap, but could be an important lever. Um, collaborate on uh, uh, EV and e-bike sharing programs. Uh, again, this, this appears in, uh, in uh, other jurisdictions caps. Expand uh, EV readiness and charging infrastructure requirements for new and remodeled uh, building projects. So here, there's a precedent for this in almost every jurisdiction, uh, but this is a reach code. So, so the idea would be looking at uh, jurisdictions across the Bay Area and deciding um, you know, which reach code is gonna be the best fit for, for Mill Valley. Understanding that we are migrating our population towards electric vehicles as, as the primary passenger vehicle, we wanna make sure that we are encouraging people to build uh, at new construction and, and new remodels, the infrastructure to support that because it's much less costly to do it at that point than it is to retrofit. Uh, and so the REACH code is an opportunity to, uh, to encourage people to, um, to make their properties EV ready or outfitted uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, and then finally, uh, a focus on the, uh, the city's uh, fleet uh, Danielle was kind enough to provide me with a list of, of the fleet vehicles. There are some exciting developments in EVs. Uh, we know that in Fairfax, they're, uh, they're, they're doing a Ford Mustang Mach-E to replace one of their uh, police cruisers. And so the, the technology is, is there and, and we would love to see uh, the city lead the way by modeling to the community that EVs are fun to drive and uh, and can chase down anyone and anything on the on the roads. Um, next slide. Hey, Al, can I just make a recommendation? So yeah. we have a word document, right, that was sent around to everybody, and we should probably go through that. I have. I mean, you, you've just I gone through no a bunch of stuff. I've got comments on like each one of those points. We're gonna have to go through everything another time, um, unless we go through the word document that was sent to everybody. Probably more yep. efficient to just do it the way we just did housing, I think. I, I have no objection, but I'll defer to Danielle and, and Debbie on how they want to proceed. Are there any other points that you want to make as, as just what the subcommittee worked on? Um, in relation to uh, EVs, uh, I think, you know, if we want to switch over to the Word document, that would that would be fine and just take it section by section. Okay. Well, I think you probably want to get comments from everybody, right? On each one of these things. It's not where we want to end up at the end of this evening or? Yeah. Okay. Other than, otherwise we're going to go through everything and then we're going to have to go back through it a second time. That's I guess my own point, so. And yeah, I, I think the, the, and just for some background, the reason why we just, we decided to put together a deck is because we wanted to make sure that we highlighted some of those areas where we were going above and beyond sort of boilerplate template. Um, so we didn't lose sight of that. Yep. Okay, so start with ZV. And bef I don't know if um, before we start, if also um, Christine just wants to provide uh, an overview of this electric vehicle acceleration plan that is um, in draft form to help the the committee understand. Yeah, um, I can I can talk a little bit about this the countywide electric vehicle acceleration plan. It's something we've been working on at MCEP for the past year. It's being funded by um, from a grant from the Transportation Authority of Marin to MCEP, and we have a subcommittee um, at MCEP that's been working on it. We have a, an administrative draft plan 
that we just sent out to all the cities and town staff last week. So we're going to take the next month to get comments from staff and have our agencies like MCE is reviewing it and the county will review it. And then we're going to make any more um, revisions to that draft and then we'll release it for public review. So I hopefully that will be in March. So you'll be able to, um, to review that plan. It's, it's definitely, um, it's not in conflict with anything that you've seen in the county plan or in the, in the Larkspur plan. It's really meant to kind of just uh, provide a lot more background information and to talk about what the barriers are to EV adoption by both the consumers and by our, you know, by our, the cities and towns for their public fleets and for installing charges and the chargers. And then it identifies a whole suite of actions. There's probably, I think, like almost 30 actions that um, that the city or town can take. So uh, it's really meant to kind of just add a little, you know, flesh out what's in the climate action plans. And again, I don't think that's going to be. It, there's nothing really that's um, that's in conflict what, with what is in the existing plans. So I can't really talk about anything, you know, go into much more detail than that at this point, because it is an administrative draft plan, but it's just good to know that we've already, we already are making, have made a, a lot of progress on this and we'll have a draft available very and soon. And the language we have here with, is complementary. Um, I think so. Um, the one thing when you were talking about you know, the charging hubs right. are not in the plan. And really the level three DC fast charging, level DC, level three DC fast charges are very expensive. They're beyond what a city or town can afford to um, install. So this is something, and even level twos are pretty expensive. So I think um, there's going to be, there are, and there will be more opportunities to partner with other companies. You know, Tesla Rivian is um, rolling something out and just, you know, other other companies, Blink, um, Blink it's called, right? So I think working with third party vendors and kind of facilitating their installation so that as, the, as these needs really develop, um, I do think that there will be, um, you know, private companies that are there to kind of um, address the need, and that we won't really need public dollars, hopefully, to um, to do a lot of this, or at least to, you know, there, um, yeah. So, so I, I don't think the the plan again that the plan is for the cities to finance a, a DC. Uh, I know that this is not in the plan for the cities to finance a DC level three DC fast charging hubs. It would just really be beyond, beyond what they can afford. Um, but other than that, I think all of these, uh, the gas stations are not in the plan and really primarily because we've talked with at the state level with GoBiz and um, you know, gas stations are just kind of difficult. They're not really, we don't have the electrical capacity to do fast charging. That's, you know, and, and a lot of times these gas stations are also really not necessarily where you wanna have fast chargers because they're not close to commercial services other than like the little snack bars that they might have. You really wanna have fast chargers if they're on corridors where people, at least, you know, the fast chargers can be used like for people who are doing long trips and so they want to have some kind of a restaurant or shopping available so that there's something for them to do while their car is fast charging. And, um, and fast charges are also, you know, you want them near multifamily buildings so people can go and charge their cars if they don't have any charging available at their building. So sometimes gas stations just aren't really most ideally suited or located for EV fast chargers. I, you know, but that's not to say that it, it's not, that sometimes they can be. I mean, I'm thinking of the, the one that's off of the strawberry exit on 101 is probably a great place to have a fast charger. Um, the other point that GoBiz had made is that gas stations have very 
you know, it's very difficult for them to like shut down. They lose a lot of money and um, that just to make that change to install an EV fast charger would can be um, kind of prohibitive for their business models. So those were the points that they had brought up. And I think we just felt that the fast chargers at gas stations were probably to not, you know, you couldn't really have a blanket requirement because not all gas stations are appropriate for fast chargers. So, um, other than that, I think all of these others are fine. I have a question, Chris. Yes. Um, so the 45%, right, the very first paragraph. So the county had 45%. Um, as Al mentioned, um, you know, Belvedere, Tiburon, Ross are similar cities demographically to Mill Valley, but you know, their, their target was like 25%. Um, right. so why, why was that? I mean, the County you would think would be lower than those towns, right? So why, why, why the discrepancy and why, why should we be following the County if demographically we're more like other towns that have got a lower target? Yeah, so Tiburon does have that their draft plan has 25%. And um, you know, I think because the because the county has so much agriculture and to reduce emissions to make it to the 40% reduction, they have it's the really the only way to get there is to have 45% of passenger vehicles on the road to be electric vehicles. Um, I think it's I think they recognize that it's a bit of a stretch goal. Um, but so really the, the target from the other towns is more like 25% as opposed to 45%, 25% to 33%. I, I think Larkspur is 33%, 25% because, well, I'm not, I have to look it up. What, um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I know that Tiburon's at 8%. Countywide, we're almost, we're about four and a half percent, maybe 5% at this point countywide. So if you just look at the, you assume that we can increase um, the, you know, if the number of EV registrations go up 20% every year between now and 2030, and they've been growing at about 20% over the last few years. Um, last year was actually like 14%. It was a little short of that. But if you look at the average, it's probably around 20%. So if you just project 20%, that would get you to 25% passenger vehicles. So, you know, as some of this is kind of, it's just setting it. This one is setting a target. I think 25% is definitely very reasonable. I think 45% is a stretch. Um, you know, whatever number it is, it doesn't, you know, it, it's going to be what it's going to be. I think if you put all of these programs into, into you put them all into effect, that, you know, it, it just kind of depends on what the uptake is at the, by the community, by the by the community members. So yeah. I mean my back of the envelope, just I mentioned this when I met with Al and Debbie. So my back of the envelope, very, you know, finger in the air kind of approach was to say two-thirds of Mill Valley are um, live in homes, you know, single family residence, one third lives in multi-unit, right? So if you say that in the next eight years, um, everybody replaces one of their two cars, the people that live in single family residences. Right, since they can put in a charging very easily, you get to basically around 33%. Likewise, uh, we also have a similar statistic, which is that you know one third of Mill Valley is you know um, house rich, cash poor, right? Therefore, not really in a position to spend a lot of money on an EV, right? And the math works out the exact same, right? The other two thirds, you know, has the you know financial ability to do it. And if you say that each one of them replaces one of their ICs with an EV over the next eight years, you again, end up at 33%. So that kind of like, you know, wet finger in the air kind of makes sense to me. And also um, that's kind of like our overall target, right? Is to get everybody to convert at least one of their cars over the next eight years to an EV. So that, that would make sense. It would be higher than every other town except for the county. Um, so that kind of, that I think that is still a stretch target and, um, but you know that that also kind of makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I like what you're saying. I, I mean, I think it makes sense to like like you're saying, you know, to have it kind of grounded in some in some reality. Um, yeah. yeah, 
You know, it's interesting because I was just doing the, I did a workshop for um, Tiburon last night, so it's fresh in my mind, but you know, they only have one public EV charger and to support a population of like 8% of all of their vehicles are EVs. And there's only one, and it's not even very public because it's at the Tiburon Lodge and that's really supposed to be for hotel guests. So all of those people are charging at home, um, you know, at this point. Now, of course, as time goes on, we really need people in multifamily housing to, to be charging as well. Um, it is more difficult, but I do think, you know, like you're saying, the, it's the single family homes that are kind of the easy, that's the low hanging fruit really at this at this point. We have Susan and Paul that have their hands up and they've been waiting patiently. I guess I'll go since you said my name first. Um, on item C, uh, it talks about multifamily and workplace charging sites. And I know we're talk I know we just talked about low hanging fruit, but I, I I I think I brought this up last time. I just want to emphasize that there's a small but significant you know important block of people that aren't multifamily but don't have driveways and you know exactly who they are because they have residence parking permits like me and so there's no there's really no way to charge when you're doing street parking mm -hmm. so i just i want to expand that language because it's i don't i don't know what portion it's probably not huge but i just don't want to leave it out that it gets overlooked and not addressed at all so in addition to multifamily and workplace charging sites, um, I would say like, you know, residential parking permit occupants or something along those lines, just to make sure that that gets covered. Thank you. Can you, so, uh, are, whoops, shoot, what happened? Um, are you, shoot, this is not, what I was just looking at. Um, so potentially, are you, um, it would be, I think you're asking to put something in about related to the public right of way is what that's related to, correct? I don't know what that is, but that, that, that talks about identify charging sites that will support multifamily housing locations and workplace locations and I'm adding a third type of location which is um, housing that is served by residential parking per permitted per permitted parking so it would be curbside charging right so I, I think we, it, it's on public property is what and I think there might be something about right away but yes I, I get your point and we can look at making sure that's not lost because this is Susan, this would be to address residents who, I mean, it could be that they have residential parking permit, but it could also be people who just, their home, I mean, so many people have garages that their cars don't fit <laughs> in the garage or don't fit in the driveway for, for whatever reason, you know, older homes. So addressing that need where you have people that may have bought an electric vehicle and don't have any way to charge and you know where they live right you know it seems to me that this isn't trying to indicate where they'd be located more that than here's a, a group of people that that we want to accommodate through a network it's an underserved population and yeah it, it's an unserved population and i guess the only reason location matters is because if if you put all the station charging public stations at one end of the town and there's a bunch of people you, know, you want to you want to take a get some sense of proximity i think to make it really effective so um e does mention um you know innovative programs such as installing charges at existing street light and curbside locations so that would be locations that are available for those residents those residents that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I, get, um, I don't know how we want to go about doing this. We want to go like paragraph by paragraph. So we just get this thing, kind of get all the comments in or how do you want to go about doing this? Um, sounds good to me. Yeah. Hey, Debbie, I, I have a, a comment, a couple of comments on the, on the charging. We, uh, our subcommittee looked at this very carefully. 
Um, and we found that, um, you know, there are certain opportunities at schools and, and workplace areas. Um, um, and with regard to level one, um, is, is almost useless uh, to put it in a public place because it's so slow. We, uh, I would compare it uh, to a slow dial-up internet service. It, you know, it, it's eight to 12 hours to charge a battery from zero. Um, if you've got a Tesla, which has giant batteries, you, you, there's no practical purpose in, in going uh, a level one, which, is a, uh, which would be accessible through a street light. Now, level two and level three are, are, are different, completely different, where um, the charging times can be cut for a rapid charging 150 kilowatt, which uh, takes uh, 480 volts, which is in the street in many areas, um, on the, the uh, telephone poles in many, many areas. Um, they cost about $50,000. However, um, you, they would never be unoccupied um, in the sense that this is like the holy grail of charging. Um, it's, it's much faster than you can get in your own home because you're only, you only have access to 240 or, or 220 volt, which would be a level two. <clears throat> However, that, if it's got the, the enough kilowatts, uh, it's considered a rapid charge, which is a 40 minute to two hour from zero up to a full battery. So um, that's the reason why we have level two and level three, because we thought level one is out in the public is, is fairly use, useless. It just would tie up that spot. No gas station would want to tie up that spot for, you know, <clears throat> eight to 12 hours. So so then, um, so then where do we put these um, if, if we do put them? And then we put them in um, um, like, like we are discussing, the, um, and especially areas where uh, you have multifamily homes where they're not gonna be able to individually get um, uh, a 110 cord out to their car somewhere. But if you have a fast charging system, and you have um, the technology now that shows when it's available, um, you know, and how long you're on there for and a turnover, maybe a, a turnover penalty, if you don't unplug it and want to stay all night. Um, you know, these things I think are practical. And also, um, you know, they could become a co-op. So let's say you're at, you have um, a fast charging, a rapid charging system at a school, or uh, uh, you know, in the daytime, the teachers are using it, and in the evenings, maybe somebody's going down there, and um, and you know, eating dinner somewhere, and then charging their car. So that's that's why we've got level two and level three, and we see um, a great incentive for people that don't have their own home, uh, but still want an electric car and to charge them to be available um, in in uh, more public places. So my recommendation is that I feel like item E answers uh, Susan's concern because we talk about installing chargers at existing curbside locations and that sort of thing. So I don't know that we need it also in section C. I think we can add to serve those populations It, it's the workplace as well. And I think we referenced that in C. So we can just say something about populations that do not have access. And we can we can finesse this a bit, but I get I get your point. So I'm just gonna highlight that. Okay, does that work? Okay, great. Thank you Susan for the head nod. <laughs> All right, in, in moving on, 
so I think what I heard, Christine, um, this isn't in the program, so we can um, we can modify this so it's not we won't lose this idea, but it won't be included from what I can tell in the draft countywide plan. So we will incorporate it into the, these thoughts, but not as part of the overall um, electric acceleration plan. Are there any other comments? Well, given what Christine said, it sounds like we should just take out I. Oh, yeah. So if you look at our general plan statement, you know, we, we do talk about um, allowing the market to serve, um, the free market to dictate basically land use decisions a bit um, in terms of supporting our local businesses. And I will say the two local gas stations that we do have are rather small. Um, so having them put in potentially um, these requirements could make or break them not to. You, you know what, when, and we're talking about just in the city of Mill Valley, so I, I, I get that. But, you know, just conceptually moving forward as more and more EVs come along and less and less gas ve vehicles, gas stations have always kind of, I mean, there used to be one on every corner in Mill Valley, it seemed, and now and now a lot of those have gone and now we've got Chase Bank on the one side. And, but it does make you wonder if one day a gas station, because I know before the planning commission, that first Chevron, when you're driving in East Blytheil, they wanted to expand and have a, you know, there was some discussion about having a cafe and they wanted to, a, a, they wanted to have a, um, a car wash and all this sort of stuff. And it just wasn't, there had to be a setback because of the, uh, because of the Creek um, to kind of drainage behind there, but you just kind of wonder if maybe gas stations would start transforming themselves into a hybrid scheme where it's not just gas in all these places. It it transforms into something else, and those little food inside the building becomes something else. You know, you just kind of wonder if that can't be part of our evolving, um, you know, infrastructure and community. But it's a little hard to say do that now, but the well, I think the, very different. the idea is the free market bears that. And if there is some benefit in that gas station making money, right, they, they will definitely make that modification. And as the fleets are changing, they might have to change their business model and, yes, get find different ways of getting cars that aren't using gas on their on their site. So, well, could, could we say instead of requiring, could we say consider... Um, um, encouraging gas stations to include, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's just a way to have it in there as an idea. I think if, if the task force feels like where the gas stations are, are, are appropriate locations, would be good locations for fast chargers, then sure, why not say encourage gas stations to provide EV fast chargers? Well, um, I'll, I'll address that and Al, um, you might want to chime in. We actually, we had a discussion about gas stations and charging, and we actually could seriously considered banning all new gas stations. And that sounds very radical, but uh, to Greg's point, there are no new gas stations. As a matter of fact, we're losing gas stations, um, and uh, eventually they'll, you know, eventually they'll all be gone. So that it doesn't make, so the, the practical application of putting an electric charger in a gas station um, would be a diminished value compared to putting it in a, a more public or a co-op type of situation where uh, ride sharing, um, delivery services, something like that, they could, um, uh, you know, carpoolers could use it at a more central place. And uh, again, the real estate and the gas station, um, they need turnover and uh, charging an electric vehicle, even at a, a fast 220 is gonna tie up that uh, spot for a long time. So we, we decided not to, you know, um, 
put on the table banning um, uh, uh, gas stations as, as more of a symbolic thing, not for practical purposes, because there aren't any new ones. But um, it, uh, get, we looked at gas stations and, and they make no sense. And I, I wouldn't encourage um, you know, a remodel, an EV in a, um, a fast charger in a gas station. Al, what, you wanna add anything to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the language as it's written right now, I don't think it, it does any harm, but uh, ultimately I think when you're being prescriptive about what a business should or shouldn't be doing, you tend to create inefficiencies in, in an economy in general. So I, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't care if that provision were gone. Um, and it, Can you it, just raise a hand if everyone's fine with removing this? Everyone. So one, two, three, four, five. So, okay. We're going to take it out, but I can note, in, we can note actually in the, the record that we did take a vote and we can indicate um, Paul, Susan, and did Fiona, did you raise your hand? You did, okay, maybe it was two, Paul and Susan dissent. Okay, great. With that, oh, yep, Al. Yeah, so uh, I think it looks like we're nearing the end of this section. So I just wanted to um, maybe just- I haven't, had a I haven't had a chance. I keep saying we should go through this thing <laughs> from the beginning, go, go through it, right? And we keep not doing that. So I'm just waiting till we kind of get back on track on this document. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we we had, but if, if we're still in that process, that's fine. Yep. So. Paragraph one, I made a comment about what this target should be. And there was, are you guys all fine with my recommendation or did anybody else want to follow that on? That, that's what I was going to speak to. So it's- uh, Yeah, so I'm, <laughs> at, I'm at the beginning of this thing. Right okay, now. so um, on the targets, and, and I don't have a clear answer to this, but the question for the group, and it may be a strategy question as much as uh, a, a, a sig signaling question is, should we be adopting targets that are comfortable and that we expect to exceed, or should we be adopting targets that are stretched targets, but that are still potentially achievable with focused effort? Um, and again, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I understand that that you know when we're designing the climate action plan and we know what process it has to go through for approval. We're anticipating a need to minimize flashpoints. Um, at the same time, we have stakeholders like, uh, like Fiona, who are probably going to expect us to do as much as is humanly possible to alleviate the crisis that's, that's been created. And, and I know we don't want to inconvenience people or, or make people alarmed at the pace of change, but you know the science is is pretty clear that that the pace of change needs to be pretty dramatic here, and so if we are not adopting stretch targets, it, I just want to be clear about why, uh, and, and that doesn't mean I won't accept it. It's just it'd be useful to know why that would be the case. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, on, Sorry, go ahead. On the behalf of the stretch targets and. Um, you know, shooting higher than maybe other um, cities around us. I think that um, if we do aim a little bit higher than others, it's gonna incentivize um, more change and more um, working towards this higher goal rather than stopping at say 25% when um, there is the option to go farther. Irvin, were you going to make another comment? Yeah, no, I was just going to say 35% is a stretch target, just to be clear, right? So 
you know, 25% is where essentially all of Marin is ending up. 45%, as Christine pointed, was an unrealistic target in order to make the, the numbers work, right? So 35% literally puts us at the top of the top of the pile. So I think that is a stretch target. And if everybody's happy with that, then I'm happy to move on. Shall we vote? Well, what, what are we, I guess um, Al mentioned is that what's the harm of having it higher, I think was the question. Well, we're trying to have a realistic plan here also, right? Yeah, I think that, I think I the mean, harm could be that um, when you have a development project that's doing an EIR and they will often look to the climate action plan as, um, and if they, if the, if the project is found to be, you know, they say it complies with the climate action plan. So therefore we should be able to, um, you know, that, that we therefore are within the greenhouse gas emissions that are anticipated. Anyway, I think the, the thing is that if an EIR is pointing to a climate action plan, that the climate action plan should be grounded in reality and should be using, you know, vetted methodologies. And we should be looking at, you know, past performance indicators and just realistic. I think it should be realistic. So. Urban, can you go through your 35% formula again? Sure. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I'm all in favor of putting in a stretch target, right? Which is why I basically put this in higher than, you know, every other town except for the county. So I'm all in favor of doing that, but I also believe that it needs to be realistic. And I don't think we all need to acknowledge that we are all, you know, um, evangelists on climate action, right? All of us here are, but we have to present a plan to 14,000 people in Mill Valley, right? And not everybody is an evangelist on climate action, right? So it has to go through that vetting and we just need to be always putting out a plan which is realistic, right? We cannot be putting out a pie in the sky plan. And um, so anyway, that's, that's my overall approach. But again, you know, so you can look at this one of two ways. One third of households are house rich, cash poor, i.e. they don't have money for an EV. Also, one third of households live in multi-unit housing, right? So choose either methodology, it doesn't matter. Look at the other two thirds as your prime target, right? The low hanging fruit, the first adopters in, you know, in moving towards EV and assume that half of them in the next eight years exchange one of their two ICs for an EV, you get to 33%. That's basically the, the math that I went through. This very quick back of the envelope, hey, does this make sense? And I'm, I'm going on that sort of like, you know, one household, every household has got two cars and they replace one because very early on, like Christine, I think I got this from you. And um, when you presented to the, you know, the county mayor and council member um, discussion on climate, we talked about like, hey, what, what do we actually really want to try to accomplish here? And the first thing on there was to get everybody to, uh, you know, to buy one EV, right? And, and it's like a very simplify. And I sent this around to everybody in this group, you know, previously when we started this thing. So I've had that in my mind is kind of like a very nifty target, but it doesn't apply to the entire population because not the entire population is in the position to buy an EV. So that's kind of, that's where I was going towards. Okay, that makes sense. Is there an incentive? Uh is there a premium on the demographics of Mill Valley and their their consciousness on the on the um, carbon reduction and the and the cars involved in that? Would you put a premium on that, or is this just? Well, I already have. I already have. I mean, Tiburon, you know, Ross, every other town, right? I mean, I know the people in San Anselmo. I mean, the people on the on the city council in San Anselmo they are all climate evangelists. I mean, that is a very strident group, right? And the fact that we are going higher than they are really says that we are stretching this thing. Good. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody here should feel bad about 35%. I think you should be pretty damn happy. I just want to make sure it's a realistic right. number, right? So. Well, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I get the point. I think we ought to not belabor this too much and put in 35. But if we beat 35, you got to buy me a drink. 
Urban. <laughs> I'll buy everybody here a drink. Everybody. So <laughs> buy everybody an EV. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Okay. Well, yeah, I'll take my uh, ten dollar a day city council salary and buy everybody an EV. <laughs> Um, so let's take a vote on 35% in urban buying everyone an EV. <laughs> All in favor. <laughs> and you put it that way. Okay. No, and seriously, I, I, if, if, just to keep this moving, 35%. Is everyone comfortable with 35%? All in favor. Fiona? Yes. Aye. All right. Al? Oh, okay, awesome. Okay, Great. so okay. Let, if I could just make a few points, I know that you guys want to move on, I'll, I will too. So uh, I'm on the board of the Transportation Authority of Marin. I think um, we do some of the funding for some of these EV charging um, stations. So this topic has come up. I think that's the right organization to kind of lead this whole thing. So there are apparently 700 public charging stations in the county of Marin already, right? And I've asked uh, the director of TAM that we have a discussion and a top-down strategy on how we implement further penetration of EV charging in this county so that we are doing it in a way which distributes these things in an intelligent way throughout the county because we don't need Mill Valley doing a bunch and then there's none in Sausalito, there's none out in Tiburon, right? So it needs to be done in an intelligent top-down way. And I think that's the right way, right? We already have a large number of public charging stations in this county. We just need to fill in that network in an appropriate way that makes sense from a network standpoint. That's the first thing. Secondly, you know, things have changed, right? And we've had this discussion on the TAM board. Things have changed. We're no longer driving Nissan Leafs that, you know, you leave your driveway and you immediately have to start thinking about charging because the battery is so small. You know, modern EV goes 300 miles on a charge. 95% of trips are 30 miles or less. 95% of trips are 30 miles or less, right? So people are not in the situation where they need to find a public charging station like they did in the past and cars are in a position to go much, much farther. So the whole concept of like focusing on putting in public charging stations, it's a little bit past kind of where we are, right? Because the mileage has gone up and people are putting charging stations in their homes. So that's just kind of like a top-down point of view on all this stuff. I wouldn't necessarily get hung up too much on this. I would let organizations like TAM, and I will definitely take this thing on to make sure that we get the network in the right way for this county. I think that's the right way to go about doing this thing. Um, and that doesn't unfortunately address multi-unit housing. We're gonna have to try to find a way to kind of get charging into those, you know, into those uh, units. But those people in any case, right, for the most part, that's not gonna be innovators in terms of adopting new technology, right? And in the next eight years, we're definitely talking about the innovators adopting a new technology. That's the way technology adoption curves work. They don't go for the laggards first, right? They go for the innovators first. So that probably makes sense just in terms of getting us over the hump to 35% kind of out the gate. And at that point, uh, buying an EV will be a lot less expensive, right? And then the next generation of people can follow along. Um, incentives, there are a lot of state and federal incentives. And I think those are the incentives that we should be talking about. I have to just warn you, there are not gonna be incentives from the city of Mill Valley for buying private individuals EVs. We're not gonna be providing incentives for that. We cannot encumber our existing resources with an additional expense. We have enormous, and I can spend forever talking about the huge investments that we have to make in the city, which we do not have funding for right now already. So we're not going to add an additional thing on involving buying assets for private individuals with city resources. That has to come from state and federal funds. It cannot come from the city. So I just wanna make that clear, that first point, it just needs to be very clear that those are not city funds that are going to be uh, implemented in this case. And that's most of my, um, that's most of my comments on this thing, on the first part of it at least. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Uh, Ur Urban, uh, Urban, a quick note on one of the things you mentioned. Um, we had a more detailed report that went along with this markup, uh, but were advised to kind of hold off on that. So one of the items identified in there was to uh, encourage uh, TAM 
to direct some of the Measure B funds toward uh, private multifamily housing opportunities uh, yeah. for, for charging. So um, maybe as a champion of that uh, at TAM, uh, you could just take note of that. That came from the EV uh, advocacy community. You know, and that's a great idea because part of what TAM is trying to do, like every other organization, is try to um, move towards more equity orientation in their funding. So that's a fantastic suggestion. Well, and I also think what got lost is our subcommittee drilled down for hours trying to come up with statistics on for the planning department to use when we do go to multi to new multifamily units how we should resize the parking so should we have an ev charger in there should we have less gas parking spots so we did a whole drill down and that's not in this document either so there's a lot of work that can be done there. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about parking because there's a section on parking here. And I have to just warn you, parking is a hot topic. <laughs> you really wanna avoid it at all costs. That is something that you do not wanna get into. People get very, very emotional when you talk about taking out parking places, um, limiting parking places. I am telling you, it's like, it's like put a siren on this whole thing and you'll get everybody out with pitchforks trying to stop you from doing this stuff. So you're very careful with that stuff, right? Um, yeah. You don't wanna be prescriptive in terms of taking out spaces for EVs. People are already pissed off about EV parking spaces. So, you know, we have to be very, very careful here. We can't be prescribing those things on private property. No, but I think what we're talking about is, for example, what, what I've been thinking about as I've been hearing the presentation is, if we have something like one Hamilton, or if we have some future, um, you know, affordable housing, multifamily housing developments, or some of these mixed use projects where, you know, our, our municipal codes require so much parking that they can't get enough units in. And, and how could we, we could do shared parking? How can we, you know, change our municipal codes? So these new developments, you know, you're talking about innovative and, and new ideas is that, you know, maybe there's a, a car share with, um, you know, as an alternative inside of uh, multifamily housing in the new projects. So somebody doesn't have to own a car. There can be, you know, the equivalent of a zip car that's electric um, with a charging station there or multiple cars so that, you know, we don't have to, some people don't even have to have a car. <clears throat> So yeah. let's time let's time out for a second. Let's get through this section and then we'll get to that party. So are we done? What can we move on? Um, does anyone else? I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. And I know we'll talk about parking, but I just want to make sure we can get through this. No, I, I agree. I was just thinking that that had to do right. with electric vehicles and how could you accommodate, say, electric vehicles in a TAM park, you know, not the TAM parking lot, but that Mill Valley parking lot at 411 Miller or, you know, how, how can, and that's getting prescriptive, but, you know, Al went through that list in the beginning that kind of highlighted bike sharing and car sharing. And I'm just kind of curious as to how we can incorporate that into our discussion, um, because in, in a sense, that's part of the, um, the solution. Um, my only comment on this last, on the document is under M. Um, I don't think we can require um, these delivery services use EVs, but we can certainly encourage them to do that. But otherwise, um, everything else is fine. I'm ready to go on to uh, bicycles. Is everyone else okay? And good news, I got no comments on bicycles, so <laughs> I'm done with that section. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and uh, Karen Jaber, in any case, is going to have to implement this, so if anybody's going to have a comment, it's going to be her. <laughs> We have a lot of work to do. Well, and Glad you're here. <laughs> um, one of one of the things that came up in the in the subcommittee conversations was establishing a target for uh, VMT reduction, vehicle miles traveled reduction, so that we we in the city don't get lost in the weeds of all of these individual measures that roll up into vehicle miles traveled, and pe people are clear that in addition to getting people to switch from internal combustion engine passenger vehicles to EVs. We also want people to drive less because that has tons of co-benefits for people's health, 
anger management, a whole host of things relating to our traffic problems, in addition to you know, the, the dramatic climate impact of, of having people take all of those short car trips that Urban was referring to uh, instead of biking or walking or, or skateboarding or taking uh, public transit. So uh, one thing that, that I was hoping people could talk about briefly and weigh in on is whether uh, we should ask Christine to think about whether a VMT reduction target as, as kind of a meta target that rolls up the sections that you see there uh, in the box to the right on the screen, whether that's something that makes sense uh, so that we can have, have a meta target for people to look at similar to the one that we have for EV, EV adoption. So just in regards to thinking about, as Christine mentioned, um, getting housing approved in the city, I, I would be, uh, VMT is a target we're already having to face in terms of reductions. And I believe this, we already have required goals based on the new VMT targets or VMT metric. So I would be very careful in what we do here, just in, in light of work that we're doing to accommodate new housing in the city. Yeah, I think what we could do is, you know, I could do the calculations to say if we reduce BMT by 5%, that would result in a reduction of, you know, X amount of greenhouse gas emissions and just, you know, kind of put it out there as a call out for rather than being a target, like it, it's sort of a target, but it's not saying that, that it's not substituting the other calculations that are done for the individual pro programs. So, so why don't I, why don't I play with that? And we'll, we'll look at that when I, when we have a draft plan, it would be my suggestion. I would so, say what the, one of the problems that you're going to have with this, so just very briefly, Plan Bay Area, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Plan Bay Area, but basically it's a plan for the entire, uh, the entire area for 2050. And one of the big problems with this whole thing is that the jobs are forecast to grow in the city, but all the workers are forecast to grow or to live in places like Mill Valley, right? So essentially it's setting us all up for more transportation as a big problem, right? And if you're talking about BMT, that's gonna count against us, right? Because they're gonna originate and end in Mill Valley. So is there, is, a, there, is there a way to consider some of these ideas that might come out of our housing element and how we could grow, not just in ADU numbers scattered on the hillside, but you know, the goal would be to get more density in the various areas where you wouldn't be required to have as many vehicles miles traveled and and you know as we have to rezone to get encouragement for for mixed use and and uh, a little more density that that's going to help in, increase housing numbers in a way that hopefully doesn't re, um, increase vmt in the same way i'm just going to add that you know i think the general plan framework already um accomplishes the goal you know miller avenue for example um you know, already the current general plan policies call for um, higher densities along Miller Avenue. And we're looking at Miller Avenue corridor um, to accommodate our, our regional housing needs allocation. So the sites inventory, but uh, the key to impart, not just the jobs housing balance is also uh, putting residential closer to services. Um, shorter headways with transit, you know, and that's somewhat out of our control because we are not the transit provider, but having bus stops um, and more frequent headways um, in our community where there's better transit service. And again, um, holding on to the retail uh, uh, inventory that we do have like downtown and, and, you know, say mixed use along Miller Avenue where instead of a vehicle trip, you can just walk uh, to services. Now the jobs is a bit of a quagmire as, as Council Member Carmel, like Urban had mentioned. Um, that is a, uh, some of the comments and feedback that other jurisdictions made on the Bay Area plan that you know all the jobs are in Silicon Valley and the uh, housing is spread out throughout the Bay Area. So that's all well and good if you live next to BART, 
But um, I think the key is transit. And I think Christine is on to a, a very practical solution here with, with respect to the BMT issue. The other thing I want to um, mention is that the Metropolitan Transportation Commission does develop VMT forecasts for all of the cities and towns, and they base that on the Plan Bay area. So the forecasts that are available right now that we'll probably end up having to use in this planet are 2040. Hope maybe, well, we'll see. I've been in touch with staff there and asked them when they're going to be updating the forecast to reflect Plan Bay area 2050. So, but the idea is that, you know, they know where the housing has been identified, what the arena, where the arena is, and, um, and they also, you know, look at the transportation improvement projects that are um, included in the Plan Bay area, because it is a, a regional, it's a, it's a housing and transportation plan. And so they do develop the VMT forecast. Yeah, and we are relying on TAMS. Um you know, trip generate uh, BMT uh, numbers um, for environmental studies for affordable housing. So we really have to be careful um, in, you know, the reach approach uh, to BMT in light of, you know, so the, the affordable housing projects that we have on the table right now. And um, we wouldn't want that to be a, a, an impediment um, to create significant unavoidable impacts that you know, um, would, would be an impact to, to what we're trying to accomplish with housing. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. We do not want to create something which is going to be an impediment to our housing element. And just so everybody knows, we have to create a plan for 865 new housing units in Mill Valley over the next eight years. So in the interest of time, I think we should um, let Christine look at this and revisit it upon the um, quantification and uh, the draft climate action plan and see what we get. Okay. Blocking, any comments? Well, only that as someone that will walk from here to Strawberry Village to get something to eat and walk back um, after going on a loop on the ridge or something just to get some exercise. It is not a very walkable, friendly um, community in a, in a lot of different ways. So I don't know. I, I know the BPAC is is working on that, but but I I try to not use my car during the week and um, and walk everywhere. And and it is a challenge. So it's about getting, I mean, if you ever tried to walk um, over and then along some of these busy roads and then try to get back from Strawberry Village to um, East Blytale and then back into town, it's, yeah. it's pretty sad. We have a lot of work to do. Yeah, so I was just gonna add both on the bicycle and on the walking sections, um, Karen, something that is different from what's currently in the transportation plan. I know that you'll be working with BPAC to um, provide an update memo or something along those lines for the transportation plan this year. And so we just want to make sure that we're tasking the BPAC with including a stronger vision around targeting projects that have an impact to VMT. Agreed. Yeah. Got to get people to walk or bike ride or scooter. <laughs> On the topic of scooter, that, is it mentioned in here? I apologize if I overlooked it. There was a scooter sharing line item there mm -hmm. for bike and scooter sharing. OK, thank you. Yeah. But I was wondering, I didn't see anything. Did I miss the one that talked about that talked about car sharing, um, except for on that very first outline that that I went through? I was just kind of curious because that that seems like that wants to be under the the zero emission vehicles. It, it is. Oh, it okay. is. I'm sorry, I just it missed is. it. Yeah, that's OK. Um, somewhere. Yeah, what we did not talk about, 
at length is uh, what BPAC is going to have to work into their updated plan is the new proliferation of cargo vehicles, e-bikes, and scooters. Uh, imagine Greg walking over to Strawberry at lunch and it's now lunchtime and school's out and all the e-bikes are riding on the same sidewalk as him to get over to Strawberry. It's We have a lot of work to do. Yeah. And just on that bike sharing, um, you know, Tam is working on a bike sharing program, right? So there's a pilot program right now. It basically originates at the uh, at the ferry terminal or where the smart train comes in, right? So, and the initial pilot is just in kind of a concentric circle around that area. Unfortunately, it doesn't reach all the way down the Mill Valley yet, but that would be like, if it's successful in the pilot, that's kind of like the next step is to do that. Well, my first thought was, you know, if you have the bike sharing in Sausalito where the ferry is, you have you have a bank of them here in Mill Valley, you know, you wouldn't, if somebody was going to take the ferry um, out of Sausalito, they wouldn't have to drive um, th there. They could, they could get a bike share and then park it at, in Sausalito. And we could collaborate with other communities to set those things up. And, and maybe there's a bank of them over at, um, you know, at Strawberry. And, and so that's, that's County Mill Valley, um, you know, Sausalito, and, you know, it's just, and then possibly even Tiburon, because then you're, you're connecting with various um, ferries and, and other um, popular destinations to get to that might have some space to accommodate those things. Yeah, so there's a pilot to, to do that, right? To basically kind of fire this thing up and kind of work out the kinks. So uh, nice. that's kind of ongoing, yeah. All right. In, I'm sorry, I'm going to start pushing you guys to yeah, move man. along. Um, Crack the whip, uh, Danielle. I'm sorry. Yep. Safe routes to school and public transit. I had no comments on any of this. How can anybody argue with that? Right. <laughs> um, I do have a comment on the yellow school bus. Yellow. Right? So yeah. Yellow school bus um, got killed during COVID, but it was not, frankly, a particularly... It, there was never really great uptake on this program. It was one, extremely expensive. Um, and two, there were only 165 kids that, um, that ended up taking up and it was quite expensive for them. Cost the city a lot of money, cost the school district a lot of money. It's kind of, I don't know. I mean, I think we'll try to circle back to this idea again, maybe in a different format, but just so you know, um, that program has been tried. It's been kind of terminated. Um, but certainly, you know, encouraging public transportation, absolutely. The problem there, we can't even get the number four bus reinstated, right? So kids used to take the number four bus up and down Miller Avenue to get to school and Golden Gate Transit killed it. So <laughs> it's challenging. Yeah, right? well, that's but, a problem because my, my, my daughter was taking that number four even though she had to go around the horn um, through downtown to get back to yeah. Tam. Anyway, I'd probably just, I would probably remove the yellow school bus part and just talk about um, using uh, public transportation to kind of get to and from school on that item, just given that we've been around this thing already. Well, uh, that was my only comment on that part. The, um, uh, if I can talk about the number four real briefly, what I've heard from several different people, if they brought it back, they'll ride it. But um, the, uh, the bus doesn't want, they don't want to, bring the bus back because there's no um, uh, ridership that they anticipate, but it's kind of like a chicken and an egg and the changes, people have changed their habits. So what we have to do is we have to implement the program, say bring back number four, and then they'll change their habits again. But Golden Gate Transit doesn't want to do that because they're going to lose money until people change their habits. The number four is essential. It's essential. It's it's uh, you know everybody who rides the number four likes the number four, but now you know here we are stuck without the number four. So I don't know how long they can go with losing money, but I would imagine eventually you know you implement these programs, habits change, and then you get the intended results. Yeah. So I have I have many times in the TAM board meetings where there are two members of the GGT board uh, that are also sit on TAM complained about the number four bus and they have heard it <laughs> they know that this is a sore point with people in Mill Valley 
And the number four bus was the most popular bus route in Marin. So it's a big route. I totally agree with what you just said, Paul. And it's super frustrating that they will not reinstate this thing. And I agree with exactly with your logic on this thing too. So yeah, that's just where that is right now. Susan? I just I just put in the chat, if we could vote on the yellow bus, I, I, I would personally, I see, I totally see the point of, but I still would like to keep it in here because if four doesn't come back, there's no, maybe it makes the yellow bus more attractive. And, you know, maybe there's other things that go alongside it to, to boost ridership, but I just, I just hate to see that taken out completely. If we could vote on that before we do decide to take it out. Well, well is there, is there any other alternative to about, you know, um, lobbying for other public transportation instead of being specific and calling it the yellow bus? I mean, there's, Right. Well, so what this, what this does now is it's it basically is promoting student use of regular transit to reduce. So that's very the, the pro this policy would then be discussed of how how that would happen. It could it could include various forms, including yellow bus, but the yellow bus isn't spelled out. It could be shuttle service. It could be whatever. Yeah. Um, it's just more generic, but provides some flexibility depending where everything stands with whatever. Um, yeah. So not to belabor the point, but just kind of um, one, we're lobbying to get number four back, that's ongoing. Number two, um, there's a different group that's looking at potential shuttle services. There's a group in San Rafael that does this. It's something that's being looked at, right? So there are a number of things which are going on, which is why I recommended that the language get changed just the way Danielle has it. So you don't think it any benefit in and just listing a number of um, options like shuttle services, et cetera. Um, I mean, that's what those are, right? I mean, they're public transit, right? So shuttle services are public transit system. Okay. Well, if you think that that's robust enough to cover, to cover some of the other creative things that someone might be um, not thinking about. Yeah, just again, top down. And um, this is like, a this is a big issue, right? So school traffic, is a major source of congestion in our city. So getting kids to not get dropped off, to not drive to school is an imperative in this town, right? So trust me, no one's gonna forget about like this, this particular topic because we have to find a way to get our numbers up. And everybody who's been on BPAC knows this, right? Roughly half the students get dropped off, even at places like Park School and Old Mill School, which are, which are neighborhood schools. Half the yeah. kids are getting dropped off, right? It is a crime. So yeah, no, it's this is like, trust me, nobody is forgetting about this issue, right? It's a, it is the number one issue with respect to reducing traffic in this town. So let's take a vote. Well, uh, what does regular transit mean, though? I mean, is there a way to do you call it public transit? Do you call it something so it sounds a little bit more um, sure. varied? Public, sure, public transit. Public transit, yeah. yeah. And it's really another version of C. Right. We're yeah. Just like focusing on school districts in D, but in my mind, in my mind, they could overlap. Like yeah, our yeah. our subcommittee talked about figuring out some way to get everyone to fund a shuttle that would do the loop, and it would increase during school drop off and pickup, so that kids could use it then, and the rest of the population could use it to get around town. And I saw Parks and Rec wants to have a shuttle coming from Marin City. So again, we have to collaborate with TAM and the other transit operators, but I see it all related. Yep. Okay, so Moving school on. bus is out. Can I just get a show of hands so I can, everyone who's okay with it, Susan too. Fine with current language. Okay, great, thank you. All right, can, uh, moving on, is that okay, everyone? Yeah. Comfortable employee trip reduction. Is this, uh, Christine and Danielle, is this from other um, other CAPS? Is that, what, is, that, is, that, is that where this came from? Uh, this is from other CAPS and I'll just explain that MTC does, the, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District has a regulation that requires employees with 50 or more employees to provide um, a, a transportation demand management program. But basically they're incentives to encourage their, their 
uh, employees to take transit or bike or walk or carpool. And so MTC does maintain a list of these organizations and I've already been in contact with them. They know the number of employees in Mill Valley who should be providing these programs, the number that are in compliance, the number that are not in compliance. So there is an opportunity for the city to work with MTC to get the list of employers and then to write a letter from the city that encourage, you know, says, hey, you know, there is this regulation, you need to be in compliance with it. Um, cities can also, you know, have that letter go out with their, uh, when they have their uh, business license program and, and kind of couple it with that. So, so I think this is definitely something that is very helpful and that um, the Air District has actually come to MCEP in the past to request to request the, the participation of the cities and towns in, in, in getting um, these businesses to comply with the regulation. Okay, great, thanks. And Danielle, given what you know about Mill Valley with 95% of workers coming from out of town and most of those coming from far, far away, like outside of Marin, does everything here make sense to you? Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, just like long story short, right? 95% of workers don't live in Mill Valley. Many of them don't even live in the county, right? This is really hard to kind of get this thing to, to work, right? People have, basically have no alternative but to drive. That's one of the main reasons why we've got traffic on 101 and coming in and out of Mill Valley is people coming in for work. Yeah. All right, parking. Kill. This whole section, it's just complicated. Parking is not gonna be driven by climate, a climate action plan. It's driven by many, many other things. And this is a real siren. So it'll, it'll, we are working on changing the parking requirements for downtown and Mill Valley. It's an ongoing project, but um, it's not gonna be driven by this. So again, this is a hot potato topic. It's, but it, it's gonna go into our municipal code about development. It'll get right. for new for no. new development for new development. We're not talking about making somebody at their house or taking stuff away, but it it has to go into because if we require the same kind of you know if we're developing a mixed use project and we make sure that everybody has so many parking places for each whatever, then you're encouraging people to drive there as opposed to doing alternatives. And then and then what do you have? You have a parking lot uh, building uh, mixed use building in a sea of parking. So. Yeah, if we're, so we're gonna, gonna we're gonna get towards uh, reducing parking and doing all these things just because um, you know, as Danielle can tell you, right? When we're trying to figure out how we're gonna put 865 new housing units in Mill Valley, we're gonna have to reduce parking standards for those buildings. Yeah. Right. So we're yeah. gonna get at this issue. We're just gonna get at it in a different way. So we're not losing the point. <laughs> we're just like not calling it out specifically right here because mm -hmm. we're gonna address it in a different manner. Yeah, you're just saying this document is not the place to put that. We're going to put that in, in yeah, our municipal exactly, code. Right. You, don't want to, you don't want to get into a zoning. big argument over parking here, right? We're going to get into a big argument in parking someplace else. <laughs> we don't need to have that same argument twice. So I would recommend just taking it out. We're going to address this thing anyway. I like the part about vehicle idling. How many times do you see somebody sitting in their car idling their car for an hour um, while they're waiting for their kid to get out of some sports program i mean oh, there's some I, things in there can yeah. i ask a question about the parking to christine um christine do you do you have a sense for how much impact removing this from the cap would have um, it's pretty low impact and when i've used this in the past the, you really have to say that you're going to like reduce minimum parking standards by 20 percent in a particular area. And I would have to look at parking studies to see how many parking spaces there are. Um, or, you know, or we, I would actually could work with it. We would have to identify like the number of, of projects where this kind of a regulation would come into would, would be in effect. And it just doesn't end up being that, men, that much greenhouse gas emissions reduction. I mean, we talk about every single individual parking place in our town. <laughs> it's like, really, I mean, I'm telling you, people come to city council meetings, get passionate about this thing. It's just not worth it. Just take my word for it, please. <laughs> okay, then moving on to Greg's comment, uh, vehicle idling was 
a deep dive for me. <laughs> so um, I learned that the state of California has a ban against vehicle idling, but then dot, dot, dot for all vehicles over 10,000 pounds. So I thought I had the, the source that we could say, well, California bans it, but only for vehicles over 10,000 pounds. So I searched and I searched and Palo Alto in 2018 uh, actually bans idling uh, for all vehicles within their town. Now, what they did is they had 10 exemptions. If it's below 40 and you need to turn your heat on, well then this and well then that. But I was an advocate uh, for saying that we wanna have an ordinance to ban it because I feel like we could do it in conjunction with outreach. We don't have to have hard enforcement of it right away. We could have the outreach and put signage everywhere and let people understand how bad it is. There you go. Couldn't find it in the county though. Well, most of those things on this list, except for maybe the traffic, I mean, the, the signal synchronization is somewhat in process anyway, but it doesn't seem like that kind of thing is, um, Urban is talking about reducing parking spaces. It's talking about how to um, prevent people from just sitting idle in traffic as they're trying to get in and out of town or, um, or they're at an event and they're just sitting there running their car, car all the, the whole time so they can have their AC on or, or, or whatever. I, I see okay. that so much at, at um, soccer tournaments that I've taken my daughter to or, and then the people are just sitting in there. I even saw a park ranger up on the ridge. He was sitting up there on his phone and he was in his truck with the windows up. Um, and uh, he was just sitting there idling, idling his, uh, his truck up there. Um, it, it didn't make any sense. It's like, why wouldn't he turn it off? Uh, Greg, this... just, just a quick point of clarification. I think A through D are straight out of the Larkspur cap with very little modification. It's actually E, which is not currently on the screen. There it is. <laughs> oh, okay. So is that the only one you're, you're worried about? Um, yeah. Urban? Sorry, I was talking about the prior section, Greg. Yeah. We're now into oh. a new section here, so... Okay. Oh, so actually, let's, looking... let's just take a vote. Let's get this. Let's take a vote that everyone's comfortable with taking this out. Uh, the, the highlighted part about parking requirements. Okay, Susan, no. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm no also. Okay. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Okay. What is the, um, Christine, do you have any data on vehicle idling and the impact? I don't. I haven't tried to quantify that because um, it's always been just a public information. And so there wasn't any regulations. I would, I would have to do some investigation in that one. I think that with the limit, you know, with vehicle idling, I mean, a lot of the new cars, of course, shut off when they're stopped. Um, you have to actually put them back on. Once we, and also once we have electric cars, there's not gonna be the idling issue. Um, so I don't know. I, I would have to investigate how to quantify something like that. So I, I'll just say that we can't even enforce our ban on gas blowers in this town. <laughs> so, you know, if you were to talk to the chief of police who would have to go around and basically enforce E, he would basically start laughing, right? So this is an unenforceable thing. I think the first A through D are fine, but we're not going to have a regulation that says you have to shut off your car at the light and then turn it back on again. And Christine's point is right. Modern technology, the car shuts off automatically. So there's no way to enforce this thing. We're not going to go around and like hand out tickets. It's well, I talked to the ranger and he turned his car, his truck off. Yeah. So we should encourage, we should educate, we should do all those things. But like a band <laughs> where we have to go around and like hand out tickets, it's not going to happen. Like I said, we can't even enforce the laws that we have with, for example, like gas blowers which are loud right which proclaim their presence right even that is not <laughs> uh actually you know policed yeah. so this one is yeah. yeah i think just get rid of this the last point you, you know 
Urban, it's, you know, I think, you know, because I was on the subcommittee for, with Al and, and Susan. And, and so about parking, it does make me nervous not even reference something in the, you know, in the municipal code is because I think parking is obviously, at... how do we handle that? Because we know it's going to be addressed. It's going to be the reason I voted to take it out because we have to address it in order to successfully meet our housing numbers and do multifamily mixed use projects. We just can't, San Francisco is limited parking um, and you, you can't get more than so many spots if you have a, a development, right? Because they don't want that. They want to encourage people to use alternatives and they, they want to, to make sure that they can get enough housing units. And if you, if you can't, if you can't do successful mixed use projects because you have to have so many parking places, those things won't happen. So, uh, so I think you can look at C10 here, a smart growth development, and that might be potential. But since we already voted on that. Yeah, well, can we add Can we add some language in smart smart? Well, hold smart on, we're still on or? E here, right? So I think the, the thought is, should we eliminate this? And so if I can get a raise of hands, if everyone's comfortable eliminating the idling. And we still have it listed above. Yeah, we have A through D. We're just taking that yeah. E, which right. is an unenforceable thing. Okay, so I don't see- Yeah, that's Susan. fine. Susan, I'm not sure if she's with us anymore. Yeah, Susan's here. She's right above Yeah, you. she's here. I can't, I can't see her for some reason. Okay. She's raising her hand. Okay, sorry. I, you disappeared. I can't see you. Okay, great. So on, now we're on, on, on Ken, I don't think we need this. We are a town which is 97% built out. We are already in the process of doing infill development. We are in the process of trying to figure out where we're going to put you know, these next 865 units. I mean, we're doing this already, right? So um, we are very, very cognizant of not creating sprawl because of the very high fire risk that we've got in 60% of Mill Valley. So we are already doing this. It's not necessary to have it here. Um, I would just point out that we, we the current climate action plan that we're in the process of updating was in place for eight years. A lot can happen with the city council in eight years. And if this is a meaningful, I mean, we're, we're basically deleting all of the sections that capture the intersection of housing and emissions from reduction of vehicle miles traveled. Yeah, so and and now we're doing all of this already, right? This is already being captured. So don't worry. We're in the process of doing all of these things. But, I'm Urban, what's the, but Urban, what's the what's the harm of having it there? Because it's in other caps and it's and it doesn't seem like it it harms anything. We, we are doing, doing this already, right? We're a town, again, 97% built out. That's all we do is infill housing. That's, that's all we do, right? And now we are in the process of trying to figure out where we're going to put additional units, and it's going to be in these dense corridors. So we're doing this already. Yeah, I understand. But we're just, we're just uh, so it, emphasizing the fact that this is something that we're doing. It, it doesn't seem any harm to it. Somebody's going to look at our climate action. Would it just action. be something like continue to? If we're already doing it, sure. Think continue, do yeah, continue to promote. Yeah, I mean, there we go. Yeah, people, people on the city council that will read this will say we're doing this already. It, it doesn't need to be in here. So, um, up a little outside the box, something San Francisco has done, and and, and Patrick and and Greg, maybe you have more insight in it to it than I do, but they've actually. Um, up at the uh, end of market, they have a development of I think it's fifty apartments. And uh, if you're going to rent an apartment, you have to sign an agreement you will not own a car. And they did this on a flyer, wondering what would happen. And before the project was completely built, they had all the units rented out. So that, that would be under what I would consider smart development. Um, you know, it's just times are changing. You know, a lot of the younger people don't even want a car. And if you can lower their rent by not having to, you know, own and, and develop parking areas, then maybe that's the future, at least for a segment. So I don't yeah. know. What well, that's, that's kind of why I was talking about the idea of making sure that when we're developing multifamily projects that we have some car sharing as part of the, you know, within the building um, as part of a way to get the, the project approved. And, and that, that because my son didn't have a car when he was in college for three years because he had a zip car account 
And so he, he, when he needed a car, he went and basically checked one out and, and did what he needed to do and came back. And, and I, I just, I've talked to a developer, um, the, the guy who owns the property next to, um, but the, the big wall there that's moving slowly. It's the one where, um, where the uh, 500 KFC, north. 500, where KFC used to be. And, and, and we talked about the idea of, um, you know, having, because he was worried about having the parking numbers and being able to get the number of units. And we talked about a number of things that we'd want to, we'd be looking for on how to maximize the, the amount of housing. And, and, you know, he supported the idea of, you know, if he did that and got submitted it to, to have some car sharing is in his parking lot under the building, if it helped him get approval for. Yeah. I, so I would be, spaces. Let, let's not go there. That's a potential project. So there should not be conversation about that at this point. Um, it's climate action. We can have a conversation about it, can't we? Not if you're talking about supportive approval of a project that- you No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about strategies, innovative strategies for smart growth that don't require, um, that, that right. don't require cars to be, um, and some workforce housing that could right. potentially so someone could live there without a car. The development of policies is here. And then I believe the work plan will allow for those ideas to flesh out and they would circle back to those objective development standards that are part of housing policies and land use policies. So I think this provides the support that potentially um, you're looking for in terms of land use and making changes to development standards. Um, without okay. being overly prescriptive. No, I'm not trying to be prescriptive. I'm just trying to have the conversation about it. I want to make sure we've got we've got some innovative ideas. I love that idea, Greg. Thanks for bringing that up. Thank you for talking to those people. <laughs> it's awesome. So C11, is this um, from other CAPs, these one, two, and three, or? This is definitely expanded from other caps. Um, so the California Air Resources Board is currently working on regulations that would phase out the sale of yep. uh, off-road equipment. Um, yeah, so Newsom signed a bill recently, right? A law that was going to you know, phase these things out, correct? So the state yeah, is kind of doing know. some of our work for us here. I I don't know about that. Um, yeah, I think that was this year. Yeah. Um, in any case, um, I think these first two are, you know, are right online, right? Um, these are huge emitters. This is actually a pretty high impact item here, right? So as everybody should know, a gas blower in one hour of use is the same as a car driving 1,100 miles. Sorry, 1,100, yeah, 1,100 miles, 1,100 miles. So um, both of these are, are worth doing. Um, again, the point about city funded incentives in paragraph three should probably be rephrased to be you know, state and federal funds. This is something that we're trying to work on on a county basis, by the way. So again, we have, we have a ban in our town for gas blowers. Um, other towns, some do, some don't. We're trying to get that homogenized throughout the county so we can implement it once and for all with all the landscape companies, right? You have to basically work through the landscape companies to get them to kind of stop using the stuff. So it makes sense to get everybody on the same page countywide so that they can address all of their customers in the same way. That makes sense? Yes. <laughs> it does. So I added the word, <clears throat> consider promoting financial incentives. So it's hopefully clear that it's not necessarily our incentive financing. Yeah. Okay. Are we comfortable moving on? Yep. So I think our city fleet, we're already in the process of converting it as, as things wear out, right? We are trying to to do that. In any case, this is super low impact. <laughs> we don't have that many cars in the city fleet. So um, this is not gonna move the needle one way or the other, right, Christine? 
We've done the low hanging fruit. Um, the next round we can probably do maybe like the the ticketing. You know, when we when they purchased the the little ticket guys, that was something we looked at. But they've made some progress there, so there might be some um, new fleets in the future potentially. But yeah, we don't have a lot. Yeah, I I think the city has a surprising number of vehicles actually. Um, no. But I'd, I'd have to do the calculation. Too. Well, I I walked by a public safety building and I I was uh, looking at all those those big trucks and everything else there. And I think the image what, where you were talking about earlier, if you know, if if the police department phased into electric vehicles and other people did that, you know, it just it sets it sets an example. And and it did seem like quite a few vehicles in that parking lot over there. Um, but the but the little parking vehicles and, and such like that again it just it just kind of says hey we're we're moving towards fighting um climate change it it's not a bad idea and it's in here it's not maybe not huge it's more of a it's i think it's promoting something that we're trying to do here by having it yeah i think when we when we have an opportunity to say you know we're, we're replacing something we are trying to replace it with something which is low energy usage right some some of these things are just not possible to do, right? So some of them you just can't. There are no, you know, electric alternatives, and some there are. And when there are those opportunities, we're trying to replace them. So yeah, and there's more. There's new technology. So yes, we've done the low hanging fruit. The next step is doing some of those a little yeah. more difficult, but technology is changing. So uh, you can you can use technology to use the same or less amount of vehicles. They do it now with the scooters where. You can go online, you could find the closest scooter, let's call it the city car. You can see how much charge it has, where it's located, uh, you know, who owns it, you know, what, what the schedule is of it. And you could, I think, maximize the use of these cars that are just sitting there, you know, um, that we have a lot of vehicles, I know, I see them too. And so with uh, technology, maybe you can, more efficiently use less vehicles. So I, I think there's an opportunity there. Okay, great. And that's the last page. We did it, folks. Yeah, good job. Wonderful. All right, but let's take public comment if we have any. Um, let's Marilyn is there. Hi, Marilyn. Now she got her hand up too, good. <laughs> Do you have to take her off mute, Danielle, or? Danielle, you're on mute. Sorry, I'm, I need to stop sharing the screen first. Allowed to talk, okay. There you go, Marilyn. Yeah, I just want to commend you all for sticking with this and thank you so much. And it just seems so obvious to me that the, 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 the biggest missing ingredient is education. I kind of like my hackles go up when we talk about the idling is, and the leaf blower is people in sustainable Mill Valley know. And it truly is you know, we can make all these laws and regulations, but it like, it, like the urban says, we, we've got to find a way to educate people that they're doing it because they know it's the right thing to do. But thank you, thank you for trying with all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn, for everything that you do. Thank you for being here and sticking with us. Yeah. Marilyn is one of the big beneficiaries of, of the bike infrastructure improvements. <laughs> I worry about her every day she sets out. Uh, she does not own a car. She just bikes everywhere, including on Blythdale. <laughs> oh, awesome. Good. Hi. All right. Anything else? All right. Chair? Vice so, chair? Um, yeah, so Danielle, you have on our agenda that we would invite approval of the transportation section. Um, 
I mean, you were pretty much editing as we went, so there won't be a huge lift post-meeting. Um, do you feel it's appropriate at this point for us to have a vote on approval of the transportation plan? Yeah, um, I think we probably should just take a vote on both of them and then it's in the record and then we can end our night. Great, we might wanna touch on next meeting, but that yeah. should only take a minute. Okay, all right, so let's start with the building and energy section that we went over first. Um, so um, if someone would like to make, make a motion to approve that particular section. I'll make a motion. I'll second it. Great, all in favor? Aye. 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 All hands were raised. Okay, great. And then moving on to the transportation section, um, if someone would like to make a motion to approve the transportation plan as it was edited this evening and discussed. I'll make the motion. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 All that everyone. Yeah, four members raised their hands. Okay, and with Thank that, um, next steps is looking at waste and water, which we'll do right now. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, after it, after a two minute intermission. <laughs> yeah, sure. no, uh, we'll do that at the next meeting. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll have some conversations about the state regulations, which will be good timing because we'll be going to city council with those regulations. As so, well as the foodware ordinance that's um, in process and there's some feedback about that. I think from also we should invite the chamber and their comments on that. So we can work towards that. Um, I don't think February, it's a short month. I think I might have to move the meeting to the first week of March based on various things going on um, with some housing work. I can't push it up. I have to push it down. So I will send you all, and there's ski week in there. So I think that's why a lot of you couldn't make the meeting the last week of February. So I'll be sending out a, a poll to see what, what days you can make it for the first week of March. With that, Debbie, if you wanna close out the meeting. Yeah. Thank you everyone for all your time and energy. And I mean, this was an extra long meeting, but well worth it. Um, thank you, Urban, for all of your attention to detail and the background and your support. Have a great night. Meeting adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, great everyone. Work. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.